Okay, we are live now. Yeah. So, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the first of the symposiums on solid organ transplant. And today we're going to have uh, a discussion on renal transplant, and I have got uh, faculty from uh, India and UK. And these, these are the topics we are going to discuss today. It's a pre-op evaluation and optimization of renal recipient. Uh, how we do induction of anesthesia in patients with end-stage renal disease and how it's so different from induction for other patients. How do you maintain anesthesia in these patients? How do you ensure the kidneys are protected and the transplant kidney works well? Uh, how do you take care of the live donors? Now, these are uh, precious patients. So how do you take care of them? And post-op care of the post-renal transplant patients. We will be discussing a bit about pediatric renal transplant as well. And uh, the care of renal transplant patients who come for other different surgeries other than renal transplant, obviously. So uh, from the faculty, we have got uh, Chitra, who is a senior consultant at uh, Apollo Hospitals in Delhi. Uh, she's also a cardiac co coordinator there. Uh, she's a DNB postgraduate anesthesia uh, tutor, and they have very good results. And our areas of interest are pediatric anesthesia, pediatric liver transplant, and uh, transplant in solid organ transplant as such. And supporting her is uh, Vijay Shankar, who is also a consultant at Apollo Hospital, and he's done a fellowship in liver transplant. And his area of uh, interest are uh, transplant anesthesia, critical care, uh, point of care, ultrasound, and pediatric anesthesia. And we also have got Ashish Malik, who is a senior counsel in anesthesia at the same hospital. He's also founder executive council member for anesthesia and critical care in Liverpool Transplant Society of India. And he's a chair of ACC, which is International Liver Transplant Society. Uh, his area, again, is solid organ transplant. Uh, artificial intelligence, which is the in thing in healthcare and healthcare analytics and medical management. And then we have another young consultant, Atish Pal, uh, who is again working at Apollo. He's done a fellowship in liver transplant as well. Uh, he's got, again, interest in transplant anesthesia. All of them have got interest in transplant anesthesia. Yeah, he's got also uh, interest in critical care and medical management. Also joining uh, today will be two of my colleagues from uh, Liverpool, Royal Liverpool. I have Dr. Mr. Ajay Sharma, uh, who is a consultant in renal transplant. He's been doing that for the last 25 years. And uh, he does a lot of work in India uh, with uh, you know, teaching critical care, uh, you know, management of uh, surgically, uh, you know, critical patients and uh, I've been involved in some way with him in those aspects. And they have done multiple, uh, uh, you know, symposiums, uh, conferences, workshops. And we also got uh, Nirmal Daniel, uh, who is my colleague in anesthesia. And he is also our lead for renal transplant. And all the policies uh, which we use have uh, actually been formulated by him. Uh, Ajay, can I just ask you to come in for a minute for us, if it's okay with you? Uh, yes, Shiv, thanks for asking me to yeah. uh, join. Yeah. Can you just, just uh, tell us, is, tell us a little bit, a yeah. little bit about, about your work and uh, not in uh, renal transplant, but what do you do in India? Because people are very interested, probably interested in that. Hello, yeah, Dr. Ajay. Uh, I, yeah, hi, hi. Nice uh, to see you. Ajay Shama here. I, uh, nice to see you, madam. I'm, uh, you know, when people say that I teach critical care, that way I'm a little bit of fraud in that way. But uh, it's only partly true because, you know, for any FRCS exam, anybody going for final FRCS exam, uh, one has to really uh, be interviewed by two examiners who are either critical care specialty or physiologists. So they examine you in uh, critical care and applied physiology in managing these patients. So we in UK do conduct a CRISP course care of critically ill surgical patient, which are 50%, uh, uh, you know, the faculty is 50% from surgery, 50% from NICC critical care. So something like this has been really missing in India. So that was in 2014, when Professor M.C. Mishra, the director of AIMS at the time, he asked us to design, develop, 
and implement a course. So we have done it at uh, uh, 19 medical colleges, 63 courses, and uh, have taught, trained more than 1,600 candidates in developing skills, how we can save these patients from uh, being taken from the war to SDU, from SDU to H ITU. So it doesn't make them in two days of course, nobody can become critical care specialist. We tell them take six years of hard work, but certainly it makes them competent and confident in managing those who are deteriorating. So that is something which is very dear to me. So the principles are similar to ATLS or CRISP, but it is very indigenous Indian course. And uh, we are very proud to be associated with such amazing teachers in India. And a large number of them are much better teacher than me, myself, I can say. So it's always a, a, a learning journey for us when we do ACC, Acute Critical Care Course. Thanks, Shiv, for asking me to join here. No, no, we are important to actually have people like you who have uh, experience in uh, renal transplant. So we will be talking about anesthesia part of it, but it's important to know the other side from the surgical side as well, have input. Um, I had... Oh, Nirmal, can I ask you to unmute yourself, please? Nirmal, are you there? Uh, yes, can you hear Hi. me? Nirmal, can you, can can you, can you see me? Uh, can you see me? Uh, I can't see you. I think your video is off. Uh, shall I try that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Hi, Shiv. Thanks for inviting. Yeah, I'll let me actually, yeah, the spotlight do that. Yeah, please go on. Oh, hi, everyone. I'm uh, sat in bed because I, I have a cervical disc problem. Uh, but uh, I uh, have a regular transplant list uh, at the Royal, which is a university hospital where she works. And I've been doing that for about 10 years. So I deal with the donors and recipients on a regular basis. Uh, but my main uh, uh, aim really is to uh, have things in place to support the trainees out of hours. We deal with uh, a lot of uh, cadaveric transplants, which uh, typically happen uh, after 6 p.m. And uh, we, we run that service overnight. And because uh, it's a university hospital, uh, we have trainees that rotate uh, quite frequently. Some only stay for three months. So it's a short period of time where they sometimes uh, have to deal with uh, with a transplant. Uh, so uh, so the the main uh, procedures we have in place is to support those trainees and to just give them a framework really of what to do, what not to do. Uh, we it's not very prescriptive, but it gives them some guidance. Uh, will you be able to share your uh, protocols you have produced, you know, guidelines and things? With us today, or you yeah, I don't have I don't have it in file. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, moment, fine. But okay. yeah, 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 I can I can go through them if I'm able to. Yeah, yeah, because I think I have mentioned that on a group before, uh, so uh, I thought if you were having it, it's fine because there is time for that. We can actually have it later yeah. on. That's okay. fine. Yeah, uh, Even thank a you. Verbal thank share you would be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. I think it'll be very useful for others yeah. as well. Okay. So uh, coming coming back to uh, the symposium uh, itself, um, and uh, Chitra is going to lead it. So I'm going to hand over to you, Chitra, and uh, let's uh, get on with the day. <laughs> okay, I'll share my screen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you see it? Uh, yeah, very yeah, visible. Yeah. I would request the rest of the faculties to mute themselves, please. And only be unmute yourself when a question is asked to you. Okay, so uh, frankly speaking, this is the first symposium that I'm doing on Zoom. So it's a very new thing for me too. Thanks to Shiv, I could, you know, think of going ahead and doing it with few of my very near and dear and experienced colleagues. So we start off with this organ transplant uh, symposium. So we start off with kidney because kidney transplant is the commonest transplant we see worldwide. And uh, so the first one was done in 1954, December. And we can see from this data, which I collected from the World Statistica 
and you can see how much the kidney transplant is picking up and how much the burden of end stage venal disease is in our society and we will soon come to know why it is so and we'll discuss through that and uh, because of this i mean so the renal transplants like they are almost 4.9 to 7 million in number and in this symposia we will be hitting upon the few confusing or debatable points that we as uh, critical care people anesthesiologists we experience because of uh, the various changing you know uh, technologies and the fluids and the management and the immunosuppressants everything so we'll be uh, mainly hitting things like preoperative workup and management intraoperative management anesthesia monitoring fluid analgesia immediate post operative care how pediatric renal transplant is a little different from the adult and what we need to know so these are the common topics which you know there's such a varied amount of knowledge and information and practices so we thought we'll have this symposia so here i'll start off with the few questions that we thought we are the common confusions and uh, controversies and challenges for us so uh, what are the common etiologies of end stage renal disease uh, atish could you i mean uh, enumerate them for us yeah uh, hi uh, good evening to everyone so and the usual common uh, etiologies that we see can be divided into adult and pediatric so the pediatric we will later on see when we go into the pediatric transplant but uh, in the adults the majority of the indications that we see are for the diabetic and the hypertensive nephropathies uh, because diabetes is uh, and both hypertension and diabetes are so prevalent uh, worldwide so the other indications that we see are the glomerulonephritis the polycystic kidney diseases and like uh, patients coming in for retransplant after graft rejection uh, kinds and uh, along with the, these patients are usually the ckd5 patients who are already on dialysis and but along with this uh, there is another uh, uh, set of patients who are not ckd5 who are not on dialysis they are maybe ckd3 ckd4 and this is uh, known as the preemptive transplantation in which uh, we usually uh, get the patient transplanted before the initiation of the dialysis so this preemptive transplantation has been shown uh, to have substantial improvements in graft and patient survivals also but uh, and uh, it has been shown that the amount of time that a patient spends on dialysis prior to the transplant is directly related to increased mortality so the exceptions to the preemptive transplantation that we have are usually two the patients who are have having nephrotic syndrome and the patients who are undergoing a second transplant but within one year of the previous transplant so why in nephrotic syndrome the preemptive transplant is uh, usually not done is because these patients are shown to benefit from dialysis prior to the transplant the expectation is that the residual kidney function and thus nephrosis will decline uh, significantly with dialysis and these patients these nephrotic patients are also very hypercoagulable so dialysis tends to decrease the thrombotic tendency associated uh, with this nephrotic syndrome and so these patients are usually not taken up for the preemptive transplantation so uh, so now actually in the uh, last uh, few decades i mean preemptive transplantation is coming up in a big way but of course end stage renal disease various degrees and severity is there would like to uh, can you hear me hello yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so we as perioperative physicians would like to assess these you know patients who are coming for renal transplant and know how sick they are so so i mean uh, vijay can you uh, 
tell us how you know what are our main concern in these patients of end stage renal disease how sick would you you know how how will you qualify them as how sick they are what is their degree of renal failure and how you would assess them in the pre operative period when you go to see them yeah uh, good evening everyone so i would just uh, uh, talk about the main points which i would look for when i see a patient uh, post for kidney transplant in the pre operative period so the first thing which i would look for is how how bad the patient's kidney disease is most of the patients which we get uh, would already be in the stage 5 chronic kidney disease so i would ask them how frequently they would have, be having dialysis most of them would be uh, having around two or three sessions of dialysis uh, uh, per week and uh, also uh, something which uh, which is very important is the native urine output uh, Uh, the uh, uh, folks which are who are on dialysis for around three uh, uh, times a week, they usually don't have. Uh, they are m- mostly anuric, uh, and uh, or even if they have urine, that will be around uh, 200 to 300 ml uh, uh, per day. And this native urine output is very very important uh, because it gives us an idea as to how much volume that these patients can uh, can tolerate intraoperatively. The other thing uh, uh, which is very important, especially in a case. Whether the uh, uh, CKD is uh, 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 is end stage, the the CKD is associated with uh, uh, you know the end organ damage. So there will be uh, uh, cardiac dysfunctions, which will be uh, you know uh, uh, evident by uh, systolic as well as diastolic dysfunctions, the pulmonary artery hypertension. Uh, these patients may have arrhythmias owing to the electrolyte imbalances which they have. Lungs will be compromised because of the presence of uh, of uh, of fluid effusions and uh, and also pulmonary edema. Their fluid overloaded. The, the the bones are brittle in these cases. I also look at the ABG in these patients because there will be a degree of acidosis in these patients. Electrolyte status. I don't have to say much about it because. it's very very important all of us know that and they also will be very resistant to hypertension you will have patients who are on multiple handy hypertensives they may be on narcomin clonidine uh, prazosin uh, beta blockers like metoprolol lefeprolol and some nitrates and even then you may have a bp of uh, 200 bar 100 huh? so this is about patients who are uh, ckd stage 5 now you like what uh, like artis said Uh, uh, of late, we have a lot of preemptive work coming. Now, these patients can be tricky because these patients are somewhere around CKD stage three or stage four, and because kidney has this, uh, uh, you know, ability to adapt uh, 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 at various stages, they are not really oligopuric. Systemic changes of the chronic kidney disease may not be very apparent in these patients. They may have a, a normal ejection fraction at the most. we may have a left ventricular hypertrophy in the echo and we may feel that they more or less look like an asa1 or or an asa2 patient but when we do an abg in these patients there will be a, a, a mild to moderate degree of acidosis and we may sort of tend to you know uh, sort of underplay these patients so these are the main uh, things which i look for when i when i see a patient uh, uh, who is posted for uh, renal transplant Okay, I would like to just interrupt a little bit and uh, introduce Dr. Viji, who has just joined. Dr. Viji, can you uh, uh, come on the video and unmute yourself? Hi, that's Dr. Viji Rajkumari. She is a senior consultant in uh, surgeon in uh, in the Prasta Polo, and of course, does has been doing a lot of. Transplants for the last twenty-five years, right from the inception of in the Prasta Polo, and I mean uh, she even does it, uh, um, you know, laparoscopically and open, and she has a huge uh, uh, knowledge on this subject because she's day-to-day dealing with it, and in all uh, types of you know patients from Indian to. international so uh, viji would you i mean uh, Vij- uh, vijay has talked about preemptive transplant so would you like to add something on it and introduce uh, yourself also i mean for our chitta, guests chitta yeah. and co thank you for having me on board 
And, yeah, we uh, just we really wanted you here. Okay, <laughs> it's a it, it's an honor, and uh, thank you. We and uh, the pregnancy transplant is something which we do on these patients who are like you know actually active and who are in the stage three. Actually, we'll say stage four, stage three, one, two, three. We still consider it uh, can be reversible. Stage three is the stage of complications, and stage four is when we they reach irreversible. and they need to look at renal replacement therapy so when they look at renal replacement therapy we plan it so stage 4 definitely when the creatinine is around 4.5 see before okay. that the risk versus benefit ratio we are not very sure so it depends on the patient so stage 4 justifies a renal transplant when the creatinine is about 4.5 you know the nephrologist may not agree with us with me when i say this they will say if they with a four creatinine to eight creatinine they may take a year or two so i would like to add a, a line saying that uh, acidotic kidney oh, sorry uh, a person whose uh, creatinine is rapidly progressing or an acute uh, deterioration happening definitely we need to do a preemptive on them second thing is that we had this you will remember this uh, zambian guy who was in the who and uh, he he was an active member and his creatinine was about 4 he said i don't want to go on dialysis i have meetings to attend and he's contributing to the society and so he, you know he wanted to have his transplant his daughter came forward gave the kidney and he's is doing well he's like now 7 8 years post so i think uh, preemptive is the way to go when somebody is active we don't have to wait for them to go on dialysis to take them on for transplant okay so they have better results and with living donor transplants coming up in a big yes, way yes so we think take them all the patients are yeah. mostly a living donor program so we do yes. them and yes. you know what actually there uh, there there is no uremic cardiomyopathy there is no you know muscle fatigue and you know weakness of muscles in long term dialysis you know so all these happen so i think they are physiologically preserved okay and uh, so they 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 are restored back to work within a month within 3 months they are back to normal see faster than others okay. and you know so especially you know in a age group people hmm. you know maybe uh, you know their the reproductive systems erectile dysfunction vasospermias uh, uh, and ovulatory cycles all these get restored earlier by 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 replacing or making their physiology normal and how do we get the physiology normal by putting a 24 into 7 machine into the body which is a kidney rather than thrice a week dialysis you know you go and wash and come back again so it's kind of like it's not a 24 into 7 so the best okay. results are always with a kidney transplant okay. so when we do a kidney transplant we ask ourselves does this person have a good two year survival if he has a good two year survival this to go forward okay so i'll go on to the next question we have lots of questions okay so what are the laboratory tests you would like to do in these patients specific laboratory tests atish in short dr atish uh, sorry chitra ajay has got his hand up he is also okay, uh, okay. hello vijay and uh, thank you for you know joining us uh, ajay is uh, A renal transplant uh, surgery. Uh, right. Thank you, Vijay. Yes, yes, hi. you have already done. Yeah, nice to hear you, Vijay. Uh, it is amazing hi, to sir. see such a wonderful hi, perspective. Hi, 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 hi. Nice. Hi, you're my teacher. Wonderful to have you on board. Wow, he's my teacher. Nice to see you, Vijay. Yeah, he's a wonderful teacher, and uh, he does wonderful yeah. classes on uh, transplant physiology to pathology. To he's an amazing guy, and. Uh, you know we are proud you are indian mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah i'm always 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 there so my comment is only about timing of transplant what vijaya mentioned it is really uh, i would really if i'm in uh, working in india i would really start considering transfer transplant for those who are having who are in the secondary stage 4 preemptive one if it is available because uh, uh, the outcomes of preemptive are much better than that of uh, once you do it as therapeutic renal replacement therapy uh, at uh, uh, ckd5 in uk i'll tell you the standard practice in uk is once the patient's egfr is less than 15 means in ckd5 whether or not dialysis dependent you could you can put them uh, you should put them on waiting list provided they are uh, uh, fit for that 
So only about 20-25% of the patients who have renal failure would be suitable to go to the waiting list for transplantation. So preemptive is always better. They are in much better physiological shape. I won't repeat what we just said. Uh, uh, but uh, we really wouldn't, would not like to transplant them over here once they're in CKD4 uh, because the life of transplant is, of course, limited. But uh, the kind of dialysis facilities, the follow-up, the, uh, the, man the maintain management of uh, patients with CKD4 may not be available uh, to all those patients in India. So, of course, that is her reason for mentioning that you start thinking ahead. And uh, once the patient is stage, stage 4, of course, it is a irreversible, uh, they're in irreversible phase anyway. That is the time you start planning for therapy. So I would say horses for courses. Uh, uh, that's how the variation is there in uh, the cutoff point for uh, putting them onto the waiting list for transplant. Okay, I have please. one more to add. <laughs> I just need one more to add. Yeah. Preemptive is best in diabetics. Okay, this is something out of my, uh, whatever, uh, 2000 transplants I've seen across, they do very well. The reason is because with CKD and diabetes, there is accelerated atherosclerosis. So when you wait for them to reach ESRD and then be on dialysis and then find a donor, we're talking about living donor program. I'm not talking about cadaver. So the atherosclerosis becomes so bad that they have bad peripheral vascular disease and become unfit to have a successful kidney transplants because of poor vasculature. So they may not qualify for a transplant. Whereas if we interrupt it, you know, if you stop the accelerated atherosclerosis by restoring the kidney physiology back, then, you know, they are in safer zone, both heart-wise and whole physiology-wise. So I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm pro for diabetics with a creatinine of 4.0 in stage 4 diabetics and pro that they will do very well with a preemptive kidney transplants. That is one thing I would really love to stress. Thank you. Okay, Shiv. So we go on to the next question. Yes, please go. On. Okay, Atish, Dr. Atish. So yes, what are the you know specific other than the routine lab investigations that we do in these renal transplant patients? What are the specific investigations? you would like to do? Ma'am, uh, since this is a very major surgery and most of the patients are a little bit on the sicker side, so the it's a battery of lab, a lab tests that we usually go for. And this consists of the complete blood count and also the differential blood counts. These patients should have a complete metabolic panel consisting of the uh, kidney function tests, the electrolytes, glucose, calcium, phosphorus, albumin levels and the liver function tests also. The coagulation studies are also important consisting of the PT, INR and the APTT as these patients can be uh, hypercoagulable. And CKD patients on dialysis usually uh, suffer from secondary hyperparathyroidism. So the parathyroid hormone levels are very important. And even after transplant, these patients have been uh, seen that their parathyroid hormone levels keep on increasing along with the immunosuppression and all those things. So some of them have to have a parathyroidectomy also post-transplant. In uh, diabetic patients and even in other patients, a hemoglobin A1C, a A1C is a very uh, good investigation for the glycemic control. The blood grouping has to be done because we need the blood arrangement and everything for the surgery. The HLA typing and the solid phase assays for HLA-1 and 2 antibodies are required for the living donors. The assessment of prior and any, uh, or current infections as any uh, fulminant infection or any uh, current infection is a contraindication for the transplant. These patients should also have a urine analysis and urine culture along with a urine or a, a blood drug screen also. Okay. So you look at the albumin urea and the al albumin creatinine yeah, ratio. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, so, and these patients, they have multisystemic uh, disorders. So, you know, they have respiratory issues also. And uh, we need to find out whether they are in overload or they have any specific respiratory issues. So, Ashish, Dr. Ashish, can you uh, just elaborate how you would assess 
them from the respiratory point of view? Thank you, ma'am. And uh, thank you, Dr. Shiv, for having me, having us on board. And uh, the first aspect of any renal insufficiency is that what's the effect on the respiratory system? So how I would or what we would go about is just with the clinical step on the chest, the clinical examination and auscultation. We have a look at the chest X-ray pre-op to look at, uh, basically we're looking at the fluid overload or infection, any traces of it, get a baseline SpO2, get a blood gas. And if we uh, see the patient on supplemental oxygen, that could add to something. And asking the patient whether he's able to lie supine without a problem or there's a problem in breathing uh, issues when he's up and about. So that gives us a brief idea of what his respiratory system is all about. We do get a pulmonary function tests, and this is the basic thing on uh, the respiratory insufficiency part of it. So, yeah, I mean, many of these patients have may have paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, orthopnea just prior yeah. to dialysis a day prior to. So that would give us a hint about the, you know, the right. level. Yeah. Okay, so Atish, uh, coming back again into some other system, which is also very much involved in uh, end-stage renal disease, the heart is definitely involved because of various diabetes, hypertension. So what would be the spectrum of cardiac involvement we usually see in these patients? Ma'am, in these uh, patients, like you said, the cardiac involvement or the spectrum is a, is very huge because of all the because hypertensive nephropathies, diabetic nephropathies, and the CKD itself, they all affect the heart. So the most commonest that we see is uh, hypertension or severe hypertension. These patients have very high uh, blood pressures. And the reason for the severe hypertension are the plasma volume expansion due to the sodium and water retention, the progressive arterial stiffness that these patients have, and the activation of the sympathetic system and the RAS also. Now, along with the hypertension, these patients also have left ventricular hypertrophy. Now, the left ventricular hypertrophy can be because of either the pressure overload or a volume overload. So the pressure overload is usually because of hypertension and atherosclerosis, while the volume overload is uh, can be uh, because of the sodium and the water retention the AV fistula that these patients usually have, and the chronic anemia. These patients are chronic anemics, and so uh, that also uh, causes volume overload. Now, uh, another thing that these patients have is the diastolic dysfunction. And because of this, they don't tolerate either hypo or hypervolumia, uh, both. And uh, along with that, Ischemic heart disease is also very common in uh, patients coming in for the renal transplant. Now, the ischemic heart disease is usually because of the accelerated atherosclerosis, which is usually because of the decreased uh, plasma triglyceride uh, clearance. Along with that, hypertension, fluid overload, which increases the, which can cause pulmonary hypertension also, and arterial calcification. Along with that, uh, the uremic cardiomyopathy is also seen, uremic pericarditis, cardiac failure is seen in uh, many patients uh, coming in for renal transplant. And because these patients have electrolyte uh, derangements, so arrhythmias are a very common cardiac uh, symptoms that we see in uh, patients coming in for this uh, renal transplant and ESRD patients. So, uh, okay. So, uh, these patients, okay, they have uh, conduction anomalies also because of the edema and the, you know, the changes in the conduction system, not only electrolytes. So, that also would be one of the reasons. So, most of these patients, as you said, are on uh, antihypertensives because they have severe hypertension. And in fact, they are on multiple antihypertensives. You know, they may somehow have three or four sometimes, you know. And uh, so as an issue on that, we really feel, you know, how much of antihypertensives one needs to continue, especially on patients who are on dialysis and have had preoperative dialysis. So, uh, Dr. Ashish, what is your, you know, what do you do with the antihypertensives 
that these right. patients are taking when you go to see them what do you do do you tell them to continue right. it or you discontinue a few of them how how right. do you go about it so uh, the guideline which we follow in our institution where uh, since uh, the very beginning is that our practice is to discontinue all the antihypertensives pre op and the reason for this is that we do uh, all these patients undergo dialysis for maybe between 0 to 24 hours or less than 6 hours also so we don't want a patient to continue his antihypertensives and be hypovolemic and compound the problem of hypertension intraoperatively but saying this in what our practice is there have been no specific guidelines in the literature as of now what i found out was that uh, most of the ccb the calcium channel blockers and the beta blockers are they are advised to continue it the ace inhibitors or the arbs are stopped because they could lead to refractory hypertension so uh, the level of evidence may be low but that is what we follow in our practice thank you uh, dr viji you want to add something onto this i mean anything your opinion Hi. on this uh hi no i agree with uh, dr rashish we you know generally tend to uh, st you know hold their since they are on uh, hold their antihypertensives and uh, beta blockers we continue but then you know if we actually take it after admission how their pressures are and uh, you, you know by stopping the orals it makes it easier for us if the blood pressure goes up we start them on some ntg or lobitalol and then manage it rather than having a well controlled uh, blood pressure and then goes you know after anesthesia since it is vasodilatory so it just they tend to drop their blood pressures generally under anesthesia so we'd rather start with a higher blood pressure than a lower blood pressure so okay dr ajay wants course, to add in something about 200 or something we put them on we give them a dose of arcamine or something yeah dr ajay you wanted to add something dr ajay Dr. Ajay Sharma, you have to unmute yourself. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, same as Viji has mentioned, uh, of course, optimizing their uh, fluid and sodium status, keeping them euvolemic, as close to a euvolemia as possible during the perioperative phase. Uh, but uh, yeah, all the antihypertensives, of course, minimize them and stop it, but certainly continue with the beta blockers on the day of surgery. And uh, who am I to mention this? Uh, you all are much more expert in uh, managing these patients who are beta blocking and you know the risk of uh, stopping it suddenly. So we've come to a common, you know, conclusion. Okay. Okay, now, but some of them, you know, are very hypertensive. I mean, they're on multiple drugs and in spite of dialysis and everything, we sometimes see when we take the patient into the operation theater that they have severe hypertension. They sometimes it's 220 by 100, 110. And then we have to decide what we have to do. How do we go about it? So Dr. Vijay Shankar, so I mean, what are your opinions and take on this matter? You have to unmute yourself, Vijay. Am I audible now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there are two aspects. One is, uh, you know, hypertension by itself is a cause of uh, uh, chronic kidney disease. And chronic kidney disease by itself accelerates hypertension also. Artish has told us what are the reasons for hypertension in chronic kidney disease. There is sodium retention. The renal angiotensin system gets activated. Hyperparathyroidism causes hypercalcemia and vasoconstriction. Erythropoietin therapy, since most of these patients are anemic, and there is also a decreased synthesis of, uh, of uh, nitric oxide synthase. Now, uh, other than that, there can be other causes of preoperative hypertension, like fluid overload. The patient may not be dialyzed adequately, or a less amount of ultrafiltrate might have been taken out. These patients, some of these patients get a bolus of the steroids preoperatively that can accelerate the hypertension. Withdrawal of antihypertensive agents, uh, like we commonly we stop all the antihypertensive agents that will uh, really jack up the uh, blood pressure sometimes. On top of that, these the patients might be anxious as well. So these are uh, uh, some of the causes uh, 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 due to which they actually have hypertension. Now coming to whether we should accept these cases or not, I found out one mm. uh, 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 one article uh, in which uh, they looked at the preoperative hypertension. So 
how did they define pre uh, severe preoperative hypertension? They define severe preoperative hypertension as a blood pressure of more than systolic of more than 180 and diastolic of more than 100. And what did they find in these cases? I mean, they, they accepted all these cases. What if they looked at around 220 cases of, uh, of these patients? And out of 220, around 111 patients had severe hypertension. So that gives us an idea of how common this problem is. And they did take efforts to bring down the systolic down to 160 and diastolic down to less than 100. And none of these patients had any indirect renal hemorrhage or a left ventricular failure. Now, surprisingly, in, this, in, in the group of patients who had severe preoperative hypertension, their incidence of delayed graft function was, uh, was lower. Huh? And uh, there was no difference in mortality rates in the patients with uh, severe hypertension compared to those with uh, you know, less severe hypertension. So now the next question is, what do I do usually when I see a patient uh, with a blood pressure of 220 by 120? Now, uh, <clears throat> when I see such a patient, usually in the preoperative room, I give a dose of uh, uh, anxiolysis is usually metasolum or something, try to calm them down, look whether this uh, uh, you know, makes, an, uh, uh, makes a difference in the blood pressure, usually it brings, out the, brings down the blood pressure by around 20-20 20 20 millimeters of mercury. Also, one important thing over here is that I judge the efficacy of dialysis. Many times, severe hypertension is associated with fluid overload. So obviously, if the, if the patient is having uh, uh, signs and symptoms of fluid overload, uh, with a lot of crepitations and uh, uh, low saturation, then we may have to send the patient back for one more session of dialysis. Otherwise, most of the patients we tend to accept. Mm, we take uh, steps to reduce stress response during uh, intubation and endotracheal intubation, use NTG or beta blockers intraoperatively. Now, uh, how much, how low do we go? Uh, how much do we reduce uh, uh, the blood pressure of these patients? I usually accept uh, a 20% reduction in blood pressure in these patients. So suppose if the, uh, if the patient's systolic was around 200 to start with, I would try to keep the systolic around 160 to 170 intraoperatively. Be very uh, 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 ensure that uh, uh, the patient gets good intraoperative analysis. So that means opioids plus some tab block uh, or something of that sort. And also we need to be cautious while uh, uh, we are anticoagulating these patients for uh, any particular reason. So this is uh, my take on it. I don't think we need to uh, uh, cancel these patients just because their blood pressure is on the higher side. So uh, very well said, Vijay. Anyone uh, wants to add? Dr. Vijay, you want to add in something or you agree with Vijay? Okay, so I think we go on to the next question. So, uh, because we have a lot of cardiac issues and for the cardiac evaluation, and in these patients, because renal transplant is a major surgery, so what do we actually, I mean, we do an echo in all these patients, but what do we actually want to see in the 2D echo? Uh, Atish, Dr. Atish, can you just enumerate yeah. it? In uh, yeah. Ma'am, for the echo is uh, one of the most important things that we do preoperatively uh, for a uh, uh, patient going for a uh, kidney transplant. So the echo gives us uh, the systolic function, uh, which is through the ejection fraction. The diastolic function is uh, shown by the EA ratio. These patients usually have various grades of diastolic dysfunction, uh, starting from grade one to uh, grade three also. Any uh, uh, regional wall motion abnormalities could be picked up by the echo. Now, these patients also have uh, pulmonary artery uh, pressures in these patients are very high. Uh, these could be because of the cardiac involvement or because of the fluid overload also. So in patients who are not uh, dialyzed properly, so the echocardiography picks up this also and any valvular lesions. So, but uh, the main thing in uh, patients uh, going for tr uh, transplant, the timing of the echo is important. For the echo should be done at patients uh, at their dry weight. So, because if the patient hasn't been dialyzed properly, uh, then the patient might be having like the high PSPs and uh, it, uh, signs of fluid overload and all those things. Or if the patient has been dialyzed more than 
the patient will be hypovolemic and the eco uh, won't be uh, suitable. So the timing of the eco is very important in these patients. Yeah, and it would allow us and help us to, you know, uh, deal with the interoperative management and the monitoring, yeah. all that which we would like to, you know, do for yeah. that particular case. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so eco, of course, is done in all these patients, and uh, but I wonder if we really should be doing the stress testing, stress eco in these all of them. I mean, for taking up the, for renal transplant. So, Dr. Ashish, uh, would you do stress eco in all patients or, along with the eco, or uh, you would, uh, you know, keep it for a few of them and not do it as a blanket, uh, you know, uh, investigation? Dr. Ashish? Uh, I would like to say that we do it on everybody about 25. You know, everybody more than 25 definitely gets us. Stress eco, Dr. Biji? Hello. Can't hear you. Biji, you are muted. Can you unmute yourself? Dr. Biji, I can't hear you. You have to unmute. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, we do uh, dobutamine stress echo on every kidney failure patient for transplant, whoever is about 25 years of age. The reason oh. is because uh, age is just a number. The, the CKD associated with atherosclerosis, first thing, you know, we found, uh, you know, so as a routine in our practice, we do uh, about 25 years of age for kidney transplants. But yes, there are centers which don't do stress echo at all. There are centers which do coronary angiography for all diabetics to assess them. And uh, so since we do come across patients with kidney failure in IDDM diabetes, who are younger age group as well. So I think as a blanket, we do for everybody about 25. So it has this good and bad as well. Okay, Dr. Ashish. Yeah. So, Viji is a very nice surgeon. She does stress eco and makes our life, you know, easy. easy. But what, what is your, uh, you know, take on this? Yeah, uh, I would also, uh, I agree with Dr. Viji that I'm also a proponent of doing a stress eco uh, in all the patients because end-stage renal disease itself is a risk factor for cardiac disease. And as she said, that age is just a number. Now, to look at what is the evidence, we don't have a lack of evidence which comes into the grade methodology, which could be a strong recommendation. And we lack any re, uh, RCTs in this field. But if you look at the extent of the problem, the post-operative mortality due to a CAD is about around about 30%. And it has a significant impact on the patient's outcome. Now, if you look at what tests we are doing, non-invasive tests could uh, further would be DSE or a MIBI scan. And in case of pulmonary artery hypertension, we very rarely would like to do a right heart catheterization. All these tests may be less reliable, but they are well studied in literature. And the only thing I would like to highlight is the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. And if we could move on to the next slide, I would talk about the recent guidelines. They came up in 2014. And now, again, a paper has been published by the American Society of Transplantation in 2022. Uh, what was initially being followed was you do a stress testing if uh, you find three or more risk factors for a CAD. And a small algorithm which this paper has given, it's very interesting. It shows that I've taken one part of it, that the kidney transplant uh, candidates without known CAD, if you find them to be symptomatic, you go in for a cardiology referral according to the guidelines. If you don't find them to be symptomatic, do a 2D eco and a 12 lead ECG. You look at the non-CAD findings. If you find them, again, you get a cardiology opinion and move on to the further stages of management. If still you don't find, and on a 2D eco, you have an EF of less than 40% with the regional wall motion abnormalities, you can further go in, and some centers may go in for a coronary angiography and maybe a CT angio to look at the calcium scores. And supposing you don't find all these factors and you see that there are low risk criteria, that is, 
in the literature between less than 60, the duration of dialysis or a prior kidney transplant less than five, and you don't have any evidence of a silent MI on ECG, you don't go in for further cardiac stress testing. But if all these are not present, then we would go in for further management. Yeah, that is Dr. my take Ajay? on it. Dr. Ajay, you want to add yeah. something? Uh, my opinion based on our experience in Liverpool is quite similar. What has already been mentioned, uh, as already has been highlighted, the diabetics uh, in diabetics one would have low threshold for uh, going ahead and more doing more invasive coronary artery tests. Uh, but certainly, uh, usually in over forty, especially those who are showing uh, wall, uh, so not wall. Yeah, of course, if they have got valvular abnormalities, you need to have more invasive cardiac uh, testing. Uh, those who have got uh, features of reversible. Uh, coronary uh, reversible myocardial ischemia based on either stress echo or on stress maybe, then we would always go for the uh, coronary angiogram. The reason is that we think uh, transplant is the best option for somebody who has got anesthesia failure, but at the same time, we do not want to harm those who whom we can kill uh, because of taking them for transplant and they having unidentified coronary artery disease. It is very easy for them, as you know well, for them to hide coronary artery disease because they may not be testing it at all by, they may just limit their walks, limit their physical, uh, uh, you know, the performance uh, until the point they really tire or they uh, start alarming shortness of breath. So many of them would have asymptomatic coronary artery disease so just to make sure that anybody who has got uh, reversible myocardial ischemia, they would be candidate for uh, coronary, coronary catheterization. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. So, uh, so all these patients, they, uh, you know, they, their volume status keeps changing, pre-dialysis, post-dialysis, and also depending upon whether they are preemptive transplant patients, CKD, three, four, five. So how do we assess the volume status in these patients before, you know, when we take them up for the surgery? How do we do that? Am uh, I audible? Yeah, Dr. Vijay. Yeah. So, yeah, sort of a tough question. So how do we do this? So because see, you can't like really rely on uh, on clinical parameters like blood pressure, heart rate, uh, tachycardia showing showing uh, hypovolemia in these patients because they are on a lot of antihypertensives. Few things which I do is I always uh, uh, look at the dry weight of these patients. Now dry uh, uh, now dry weight now uh, uh, when the patient is being dialyzed before the uh, before the kidney transplant happens. Uh, or whenever the patient is being dialyzed, there is an amount of fluid, amount of ultrafiltrate which is being removed, and uh, uh, and that amount of ultrafiltrate which should cause the least episodes of hypertension, the least episodes of uh, uh, CNS uh, uh, dysfunction, as well as it should uh, ensure a good metabolic profile for the patient after the dialysis. So suppose the patient's body weight was around seventy four, and at the end of dialysis, the dry weight is around seventy one. That means around three liters of fluid has been removed. You can also look at the uh, hematocrit values uh, uh, pre-dialysis as well as the post-dialysis. Typically, the uh, hematocrit values post-dialysis tend to be a bit higher because of the chemo concentration. Some centers do uh, BNP, pro-BNP, pre as well as post-dialysis. But you know the best way to assess uh, 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 the volume status in these patients would be by doing a 2D echo and looking at the IBC collapsibility index. Now. Uh, uh, like what Dr. Atis said, the timing of 2D echo is very, very important in these patients. Like many a time when you, when you get uh, a patient for kidney transplant you know, at our center at least, we really don't know when the uh, uh, 2D echo was done. Was it done before dialysis or was it done after dialysis? So we really uh, are uh, not able to make a proper judgment of the patient's volume status on the basis of 2D echo. Unless we do a 2D echo by ourselves, at, uh, on the bedside at that particular point of time. Now, uh, other than that, something which I uh, uh, rely a lot on and may be controversial is that I look at the CVP. Now, people may say that CVP is a poor indicator of volume status. I do agree on that, but I believe and evidence also says that uh, says that 
at extremes of uh, uh, at extremes of volume at extremes of uh, values cvp sort of correlates with the uh, uh, with the volume status like if i see a cvp of less than 5 uh, i tend to believe that the patient is relatively underhydrated whereas as if the cvp is more than 15 i tend to believe that the patient is slightly overhydrated but uh, uh, keep in mind that this cvp should be before the uh, before the surgery starts with the with the uh, bed in neutral position so like after we induce the patient and then we put a center line not uh, after we start the surgery of course the bed goes uh, tilts to the right and tilts to the left then we can't really comment on the cvp so this is these are a few things which i look to assess preoperative intravascular volume okay uh, dr viji you want to add in something i mean uh, when do you uh, think that a patient should get dialyzed i mean how do you decide you know that this patient is not adequately prepared i want to dialyze i want to take out a little bit more of fluids before i take the patient up for surgery you have anything particular that, see uh, that is only if the patient has a desaturation saturation of 85 or 90 we have time and again we have seen that you know they have dialyzed the previous day but they still are you know there are patients who can't resist drinking water how much ever the family tries or they tell or you tell them like, you know, so kind of those kind of people just get waterlogged. Now, one more thing is that time and again, we find patients who are dialysed only twice a week because of financial constraints. And so, so kind of, uh, you know, they are, so I would say in India, at least like, you know, no patient is ever dry, dry, dry. We can never make them dry because they always uh, have a little fluid. So I generally, if you ask me, do you want a CVP line or arterial line? I will ask you for an arterial line rather than a CVP line yeah. because uh, I would have a head pressure rather than a CVP pressure. Yeah. So these days, in Sorry. fact, we started monitoring the arterial line more than the CVP line in many patients. <laughs> Okay, so that comes to the next question is, you know, because many a times there is a difficulty in venous access. Now, what are the specific situations where, you know, we should straight away feel that, oh, we're going to have a difficult venous access. Dr. Ashish, could you, you know, help us out on that? Yeah, I think uh, to with the little experience I have about renal recipients, I consider them to be the most toughest of patients where you could put where you would have these difficult venous accesses. First of all is that there have been multiple cannulations which have, might have been done in the past. We have AV fistulas, you could have previous dialysis lines. So you could have the vasculature being have either thrombotic or stenotic. And the venous obstruction might be there due to an SVC syndrome. So if uh, my take on it would be, if you can put a central line and a needle recipient, I think you are good to go with other surgeries. Thank you. I would like to add, you know, patients sometimes come with permacats. So then uh, time and again, we just use the permacats provided they have not had chills during dialysis indicating an infection. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are times with SVC syndromes that we had to put femoral lines on the other side and use that as CVP line. So, yes. Yeah, we've had uh, many, stuff, few we get cases of, yeah, few cases of SVC syndrome, which was really, you know, troubling. Okay, so uh, coming to the next uh, query is, uh, when do you feel that the patient is inadequately dialysed? I think we've already, you know, uh, talked about this, but Dr. Vijay, do you want to add in something more? Yeah, I think Dr. Vijay uh, uh, has told about uh, the fluid status and, uh, you know, patient having breathing difficulty and the low saturation and, uh, uh, you know, we're doing a dialysis for uh, fluid overload. Uh, the other things, uh, 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 sometimes certain patients are very, very acidotic to start with and we have, like, if you have a base excess of less than, uh, of, of less than minus two and sometimes we do send patients for dialysis again. Again, uh, hyperkalemia is something which uh, uh, hyperkalemia see, even though most of these patients tolerate potassium levels, okay, but sometimes the potassium level is more than 6.2 or 6, then maybe we may have to dialyze these patients one more time. But if the potassium level is somewhere between 5 to 5.5, then I don't think we really need to uh, dialyze them again because they would tolerate this amount of uh, uh, hyperkalemia. I mean, but yeah, we will need to give some glucose insulin bolus or something like that to bring down the uh, uh, plasma potassium levels. Mm -hmm. 
So these are the few situations in which you may have to send the patient back for dialysis. So it's mainly uh, the electrolytes, the acidosis. you know the acidosis and the saturations, which Dr. Vijay just yeah. mentioned. Some of them, you know, they they still require or they're having orthopnea or some breathing difficulty. Okay, so uh, so now we come to how do we you know go about with the anesthesia in these patients. So since you know they have various uh, changes in their pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics and the you know protein levels and everything, so uh, what would be the induction agent of choice in a patient undergoing renal transplant, Dr. Atish? Uh, could you just yeah, uh, ma'am? Like you said, uh, these uh, chronic kidney uh, patients do have very uh, different pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics also. And so dose modification is required in uh, both uh, the induction agents and the maintenance agents also. And these patients also have low levels of albumin uh, because uh, and these uh, low level albumin predisposes to increase free fraction of the drugs. Now, along with this, the Uremia also leads to uh, disruption of blood-brain barrier. And because of the disruption, there is an increase in the level of the unbound drugs which cross the blood-brain barrier and they uh, give rise to an exaggerated effect of the uh, induction agents and the various anesthetic agents also. Now, uh, in CKD patients, uh, usually the thiopentone uh, distribution and elimination are almost the same as in normal patients. The propofol uh, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic responses are also not very markedly affected. The ketamine pharmacokinetics also are not uh, significantly affected, but the only issue with the ketamine is that uh, the hypertensive effects of ketamine make it undesirable in patients with, uh, because these patients already are very uh, hypertensive. Uh, along with this, etomidate is also uh, well tolerated and it preserves the hemodynamic uh, stability also. But in our practice, we usually induce uh, general anesthesia with uh, IV propofol about 1 to 2.5 uh, mg per kg. And uh, we usually give titrated doses. We reduce and titrate the, the, the dose uh, in patients who may be very hypovolemic. And because since if we give a normal induction dose as a bolus, then that will uh, result in hypotension uh, because these patients will already have the venous and arterial dilatation. And uh, induction doses are also to be reduced in patients with known coexisting heart failure uh, and in geriatric patients also. In patients who are elderly, the induction, induction doses should be uh, decreased. But usually propofol titrated doses of propofol is considered safe. And in our institution, our practice, we usually use that only as an induction agent. Yeah. Uh, does one have to do a rapid sequence induction? Because many of them have gastroparesis and they, you know, many kidney transplant patients, they're, you know, considered to be full stomach in of course, in uh, disease donor, you know, it is an emergency transplant. So that is a different issue altogether. But in living donor, I mean, does one have to go ahead with a rapid sequence induction? Dr. Ashish? Uh, Ashish, unmute yourself, please. So as uh, you rightly pointed out that uh, DCD or uh, uh, disease donor is an emergency. So you think about doing an RSI in these patients. In kidney recipients, it is said that anything to do with diabetes or autonomic neuropathies where gastroparesis could be an important factor. An RSI should be done or uh, the anesthesia literature might be saying that it is to err on the side of uh, more being more cautious. Then the agents which you could use is succinylcholine or rocurorium, depending on what is the potassium load or the potassium level. Less than 5.5, you could safely use succinylcholine. And otherwise, if you uh, feel that it could lead to a hyperkalemic state, which is uh, practically not seen, rocuronium could also be used, keeping in mind 
that rocuronium has a prolonged duration of action in especially in end stage renal disease but the grade of evidence is lacking and in our center i have come across very few cases where we have would have done a rapid sequence induction in renal recipients and we do lo- um, more of us as living donors they are adequately fasted and uh, i don't think it's mandatory to do an rsi in renal recipients thank you okay so uh, now during the you know uh, anesthesia management during the intraoperative period so there are various monitors monitoring which we would like to do for knowing the volume status to monitor the blood pressure etc so what is the preferred hemodynamic monitoring and to be you know are there few case to case basis on which we can differ in what we use as a monitor dr atishpal ma'am uh, usually uh, invasive monitoring is required along with the normal ac grade uh, monitoring uh, invasive monitoring is required and we do require an invasive arterial line uh, both for uh, uh, managing the uh, blood pressure monitoring the blood pressure and for because sequential abgs are also required so an invasive arterial line is a must along with that a central venous line is also a mandatory and uh, in very sick patients uh, a cardiac output monitor can be used for monitoring like svv and other parameters and uh, along with that intraoperatively uh, transesophageal echocardiography can also be used but usually in our setup we usually go in for an invasive arterial line and central venous line and if required a cardiac output monitoring in very few patients that i have seen which were very sick and we have used the cardiac output monitoring for that yeah or in patients with a low ejection fraction or something yeah. but sometimes yeah. you don't get a central venous line so then i think many a times we manage with a peripheral venous pressure also by yeah, exactly. putting a 14 or a 16 gauge cannula yeah yeah or um okay dr vijay want to add in something no okay so um okay. is cvp okay. line mandatory just continuing that i mean uh, is it mandatory to have a central venous pressure dr vijay and uh, i mean is there a specific size that you use or you feel that it is now getting obsolete yeah so basically why would you need a cvp the two reasons okay one is to assess your volume status second is to have a good venous axis huh? now for in terms of volume status cvp there is a lot of uh, uh, studies which have shown the cvp has there are a lot of factors which affect the cvp like especially intraoperative your mechanical ventilation your intrathoracic pressures your intraabdominal pressures and all those things but predictive values of cvp at extremes like if you have cvp of less than 5 or a cvp of more than 15 has been quite satisfactory even though it doesn't reach uh, 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 the predictive values of minimally invasive cardiac output monitoring so i do uh, 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 like i said in my previous uh, uh, this thing like if the cvp values are uh, extreme to start with then i sort of uh, i i i i am a bit careful huh? otherwise if i uh, once the surgery starts and uh, the cvp at some point of time might be 10 at the point of time might be 2 then it might be 15 so it really doesn't make much of a sense now uh, 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 regards to whether we need cvp for uh, for kidney transplants there have been uh, two studies which are came across they had two groups of patients one in which they uh, uh, one group in which they had cvp the other group which in which they didn't they don't want the cvp there was no difference in graft uh, uh, you know functions uh, regardless of, uh, uh, regardless of whether the the cvp was monitored or not and i think that is our experience as well because uh, uh, we really don't uh, look at cvp much in these patients so uh, that is one aspect of it now uh, uh, but that being said these patients usually have a difficult venous access so uh, typically for uh, for my patients i put a 7 french cvp line if i get a good peripheral access that is if i get a good 14 gauge or a 16 gauge cannula then i put a 7 french triple lumen 
Now, sometimes uh, peripheral access might be a problem. In that case, I put an 8.5 French uh, a triple lumen or an 8.5 French four lumen. Uh, we can do uh, uh, cases without CVP if we don't, like many times, if we're having some thrombosis, SVC syndrome, uh, the femorals also may be blocked. So I had done a couple of cases without CVP, but I am more confident if I have a, a central venous line uh, in situ. So that is what my take on uh, CVP, M not mandatory, but it makes me more confident. I guess uh, it becomes, uh, CVP becomes, you know, more uh, safe when we are doing a very sick patients with a poor ejection fraction in which we need to start some inotrop interoperatively or, you know, uh, so and that and we at that point of time, maybe if we want to monitor the CVP and start some inotrops or if the patient is very severely hypertensive and we want to start some NTG or something. So in those cases, I think uh, CVP, you know, would also yeah, help. makes a difference. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I have, uh, yeah, I, yeah, Dr. Viji. Uh, as a transplant surgeon, I would want a CVP for two reasons. Okay. One is, uh, you know, if I need to start inotropes. So yeah. either CVP or a permacap access should be there. Two, second reason is because to give ATG. ATG is supposed to be ideally given through central line. Yes. yes. So that's the yeah. thing that I would like to add. Yeah, very, uh, yeah, we overlooked that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, while putting a central venous line, we can encounter many problems and issues. So, Dr. Ashish, what, I mean, what in your practice, what all are the problems that have you encountered any and what could be the various, you know, uh, problems one could have? Unmute yourself, Dr. Ashish. Yeah. So the problems commonly we see during a CVP insertion is that uh, you might have an arrhythmias and that becomes a real uh, challenge if you have a cardiac patient on the table. The other things which uh, mostly we see is uh, because there have been multiple cannulations, so thrombosis or stenosis of the vessel, so you're not able to get the guide wire in. But if you look at uh, what could be the early uh, complications, and that could be an image-guided uh, catheter placement also, and hemorrhage or hematoma has a frequency of less than 2%. If you look at the malpositioning, which is very, very common in renal recipients, you could have the uh, IJV going into the uh, arm and venous perforations, as well as an arterial puncture, you could see the percentage to be about less than 1%. And common problems like pneumothorax or hemothorax can happen with an advent puncture and as well as air embolism. So these are some of the problems which uh, we normally encounter during a CVP insertion. And uh, I have seen that in renal recipients, it becomes a little more of a challenge than in other patients. Yeah, just to put in once, I was in a, a poor LB uh, function patient. I was putting in a CVP line and in fact, I was telling my junior to put it and she tickled the right atrium with the, the guide wire and the patient went into, you know, rapid atrial fibrillation and we had to wait for the hemodynamics to settle before we, you know, went further with the surgery. <clears throat> so that's another complication we can have very frequently in these. Okay. Chitra, can I ask uh, Nirmal, uh, who's our... Yeah, definitely. Just, uh, you know... Uh, about the central venous axis. Nirmal, can you come in, please? Yeah, can you see me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so hi. we used to insert uh, central uh, lines uh, routinely for all our transplants, live and cadaveric, for maybe uh, the last uh, uh, 20 years or so. And we stopped that practice as a routine for patients uh, about three years ago. Uh, and the reasons for that was uh, uh, we found that uh, the CVP could not always be relied on for uh, volume reasons and uh, to guide uh, uh, fluid therapy. And also uh, some of the points that have been alluded to that uh, we were picking uh, the probably the most difficult patients to insert central lines in because of previous insertions and issues with thrombosis and potential complications from that side. 
Uh, so the only reasons we would insert a central line currently uh, is one, if they didn't have access, which has been mentioned. And secondly, if we feel that the ejection fraction is lower than adequate and they might need uh, inotropes. Uh, and thirdly, if we had planned for these patients to go to critical care post-op. Uh, so that, that's our current practice. And we initially found that it was very difficult to stop our practice of not putting central lines in. Because when we, uh, as anesthetists, if we have a major case to do, we feel very comfortable if we have an arterial line and a central line, because we know then that we can deal with any eventuality to that patient in trial. Uh, so we, we find those lines as a comfort blanket. And uh, we found stopping that practice of putting central lines in very difficult, both for us as consultant colleagues and our trainees as well. But over three years now, uh, we, we only use it in about maybe 10% of our cases. And the same goes with arterial line. Uh, we wouldn't insert them as a routine. Uh, we would only insert them if we felt that the patient's ejection fraction would necessitate inotropes. Uh, but you know, you, you have to do what's comfortable in your hands for your patients at your center. Thank, uh, you. thank you, Nirmal. Thank you. I think I think that was that was useful because yeah. I, I remember I think Ajay Ajay is there when Ali Bakran was uh, you know a transplant surgeon uh, he would insist on a CVP of ten <laughs> you know that was like a magic number they wanted a CVP of ten for everyone uh, yes Ajay yeah yes. Uh, well we learn from uh, Nirma Daniel and colleagues. So I can echo uh, the experience from Sheffield where I worked a few times uh, in 2019. So the reason uh, for not using CVP in everybody is exactly the same what Nirman Dalian mentioned. So they don't put uh, CVP in all the patients. So only their selective indications, then they will use CVP. And then we have published a paper with Sheffield team on this point. Yeah, so it's like difficult to give up uh, such a lovely line. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I think eventually one should when it's not required. Okay, so uh, now in these patients, uh, you know, this is like immediately post uh, induction. Many a times we feel that, you know, there are so many analgesics that we cannot use in these uh, renal transplanted recipients. So uh, then it came to having different types of regional anesthesia and blocks. So uh, do we routinely use some myofascial blocks? Which ones? What are the advantages, disadvantages? Dr. Atish, can you uh, highlight a few? Ma'am, uh, in literature, the only uh, my blocks in uh, renal transplant patients uh, are like trans uh, tab blocks, quadratus lumborum, and the paravertebral blocks. Uh, in our practice, we usually do not use uh, any blocks. Uh, we had a study done on tap block, but it wasn't much. It didn't show any uh, specific opioid sparing effects or anything like that. So we usually did, uh, we discontinued with that practice. But uh, in the the literature also says uh, in various uh, uh, studies which have been done, some studies have shown that tap block is very uh, useful and opioid sparing. And while in other uh, studies, uh, other meta-analysis also, uh, it's absolutely contrary uh, view, which says that no, uh, the tab block doesn't help in uh, opioid sparing or anything like that because it doesn't not, does not help in the visceral pain, removing the visceral pain. And uh, so, in our practice, we usually do not uh, do any blocks in these patients. Okay. And I think going ahead with the quadratus lumborum paravertebral would be a very difficult. Yeah, because uh, uh, the positioning, uh, we will have to change the positioning. Plus, uh, since uh, these are D blocks, these patients also have some amount of coagulation abnormalities also. So uh, the as of now, tab block is can still be used. But in our practice, we usually do not uh, use that. Dr. Ajay, you want to uh, give us some knowledge? <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, I'm not really, I won't really say knowledge. I can't okay. claim that. But okay. I can tell you about sharing my immense experience. Uh. So one of these days uh, when, uh, uh, this was many years ago, uh, when my uh, other colleague Shantan Bhattacharya had joined and just on his day of his uh, arrival, we operated one patient who was very muscular and the kidney was quite big and we transplanted, kidney was working very well. And this patient was really crying in pain all the time. And it is quite you know, when it uh, is happening in somebody who has had living donor transplant and such a young man crying all the time, uh, none of the analgesics were working and uh, we look for any hematoma, we look for any surgical cause. Uh, for a few hours, we couldn't find anything. Kidney was working, but he had lots of pain. So that was the time when uh, we requested Shiv Singh to come and have a look at it after making sure there's no surgical cause. And of course, at the time, he just uh, brought his needle and gave that uh, 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 that tab block. Uh, that time, that patient did not have tab block. And we realized that especially in very muscular young men, their pain threshold is lesser than most of the other women patients. That is one thing which we have seen was nothing new to you. But uh, that was one of those times we realized that the immense utility of that uh, tab block uh, in these patients uh, in pain control that, uh, uh, you know, it just vanished. It was like a magic. And because we had given him quite a lot of opiates, he went on into sleep mode for many hours. But uh, it was just like a magic. And it happened in few other instances, like somebody who has had, who had donated kidney. And for kidney, we would use uh, the uh, umbilical incision for uh, retrieving the kidney. And uh, uh, in that patient, we had not placed uh, uh, the block so it was, uh, I had that time shifting was not available and not, not any anesthetic. So he asked me to use the uh, block there using the ultrasound scan. And that helped quite a great deal. So I'm somebody who is immense uh, proponent of these uh, blocks, especially the tab block in transplant patients. Dr. Uh, can I, can I, yeah. <clears throat> so um, I remember that patient very well, Ajay. I mean, uh, within, within minutes of the tab block. I think uh, the reason why uh, there is so much of discrepancy between the clinical experience and what is published uh, is uh, the way the tab blocks are done. I think a lot of people don't do the tab block well. They, they think it's an easy block, but it's not. And uh, ours is one of the institutes which has done a randomized control trial uh, on uh, kidney transplants, uh, cadaveric transplants. They used to come in the middle of the night and give tab blocks, and, and they were randomized to local anesthetic and to uh, you know saline. So it was a properly uh, randomized controlled trial. Now, if you look at the statistically, yes, there wasn't any difference because the patients are various range. And what the shortcoming for this study was that we were using standard dose for everyone. Everyone was getting 20 mLs. Right, one thing. The other other thing was that in some cases, I mean, you need to go a little bit more posterior. I think the posterior tap, where you uh, you know, see that the internal oblique and transverse abdomen is almost meeting where the apineurysis is, is, it's also known as uh, transversalis fascia block. That is actually a lot more, and uh, some people call it scordatus lumbarum block. And that is what is actually more useful for these cases. So our cases, I think Nirmal will be able to tell us. I think all of our patients are getting tap block. Am I right, Nirmal? Uh, it's it's variable. Uh, the 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 practice has probably changed a little bit now. I think there used to be a time uh, where everyone got it. Now I think there is a mix between uh, patients either getting tap block or the surgeons infiltrating. Uh, but the majority of them would. Yeah. So, uh, because ours was a, a, a completely randomized controlled trial, and sometimes what we used to do uh, was actually, you know, I didn't know what I was giving, and uh, my, uh, the, uh, we, ha we had a, a fellow in regional anesthesia, he would prepare the drug, and then we would actually try to actually, I would say, that, oh, I know, depending on how patient behaves. And in some of the cases, like, uh, I would say, oh, this is, this is, this has to be local anesthesia, the way the patient is behaving. And uh, okay, one, once we actually had done all the, uh, you know, trial was done and uh, some of the cases, because I was noting down and looking at, and some of them was, we were really surprised. We had one elderly patient 
who had uh, saline? Okay, there's obviously once we had opened the, uh, you know, randomization and on this patient, actually the scores were almost, you know, zero to two. So sometimes it, things will surprise you that maybe that patient, older patient do not require as much analgesia. And like Ajay has said, if you actually have a young muscular patient coming for kidney transplant, they will actually have a lot more pain there. Okay. And I think the volume, again, like I said, we were limited by the, because we have to standardize. And instead of giving by ml per kg, we had used 20 mls only, uh, which would not be enough for a big build patient, maybe okay for a smaller patient. So there were some shortcomings in that. And I think not everybody does it properly. That's one, one of the things. In, my, in our case, I was doing all the blocks. So for standardization. Clinically, so a young, yeah. so a young muscular patient, definitely, yeah. as you say, you know, because the muscles get stretched and the fascia gets stretched would be very helpful. But did you give a single uh, uh, injection or did you ever put a catheter and uh, start an infusion or something? Did you ever felt that that would be a better? Uh... Uh, no, we, we only gave as a single shot okay. and all our patients actually go on renal dose uh, PCA. So that's how we were looking at. We were looking at okay. the requirement of morphine. Okay. Uh, post of morphine. Uh, so it was, because it was a trial and that was very early on. You look at, you're talking about 2008, 2010. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Shiv. Okay. So now we come to, you know, so the myofascial blocks we've spoken about. Now epidural in renal transplant. So can we use it instead of general anesthesia and what is the role of epidural in these you know, transplant patients? Uh, Dr. Vijay? Hi, so am I audible? Yeah, you are. Yeah, so uh, I mean, first of all, I now put an epidural in the transplant patient. Okay, I, mean, I think by the time I, I joined, uh, uh, the practice had changed. Uh, what I realized was that before, we used to put epidurals in most of the renal recipients. I have never put an epidural, but I did uh, uh, find certain articles in the literature, like uh, uh, this particular article in which they did a uh, combined spinal epidural for, for renal recipients. So the spinal was done with 3 ml of 0.5% DPOK, and they had around 55 patients, and three patients uh, developed hypotension. Uh, hypotension was not precipitous, it was managed with uh, bolus of ephedrine. And 19 minutes into the surgery, they charged the epidural with, uh, with 0.5% DPOK. And uh, they did not have any adverse effects with these patients. Okay, And there was no incidence of epidural hematoma in any of these patients. One thing which I couldn't find out from this study was that uh, what is the cardiac status of these, of these 55 patients? Did they put spinal, even if the ejection fraction was less than 35, was not very clearly mentioned. And for what postoperative pain they give, they put the patient on epidural buprenorphin, which is given at a dose of around 0.5 microgram per kg. So uh, these patients uh, were done purely on combined spinal epidural. There has been one more study in which uh, uh, they compared uh, epidural infusion of bibliocaine uh, with morphine versus PCA morphine, and they obviously they found better results, better pain control with, uh, uh, with epidural. But uh, yeah, there was no difference in graph function in both these patients. So what are my, uh, uh, my take home points uh, uh, with regards to epidural? Yes, epidural can be done in, in, in most of the patients. We need to ensure a normal PT and a normal APTT post dialysis in these patients uh, because some centers still do apparent dialysis. And now uh, there is also a, a qualitative a defect in platelets in these patients. So a thromboelastogram, if we can do it, that might be good before we insert an epidural. Since we need to avoid hypotension postoperatively, either use neuroaxid opioids postoperatively or a low dose of local anesthetics in the postoperative period. Low dose might be somewhere uh, at the tune of uh, 0.065% uh, of PPOK. And yeah, I guess caution should be exercised uh, while they put subarachnoid block in a patient with systolic dysfunction. I would like to know uh, uh, your view, since you have used uh, epidural in patients, uh, what do you, I mean, how was it? Dr. Vichy? 
Dr. Shiv, Dr. Viji, any inputs? I think Dr. Viji has yes, gone Dr. Viji? Yeah. 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 Dr. Shiv, yeah. Yeah, so um, we, I've only done one, one transplant case uh, under epidural, and this is long, long ago when, uh, again, Ajay, I don't know whether he remembers. This was a patient, actually, of Dr. Uh, Mr. Ali Bakran. A uh, patient had a huge bullet. So I was actually asked to review this patient and then he had an extra huge bullet. And then, yeah, you know, the registrar had gone and assessed the patient I was, and I actually did an epidural. But if you actually look at the history of transplant in India, uh, at, at, as far as I know from PGI, they were actually doing the transplants with epidurals. Ajay? Uh, yeah, in PGI, many of the transplants, I was the assistant professor in transplant for three and a half years. Yeah, many of those were done under epidural. But except for that one, which uh, you did for Mr. B, and uh, I think it was Living Door, which uh, often he asked me to do the recipient. Uh, yeah, I remember one such instance you had opted for epidural. But otherwise, uh, uh, I've not seen or heard any other uh, time um, epidural being used for transplant for the reasons we know well. Uh, Nirmal, do you have any anyone you remember or? Done no, no. Uh, so uh, in our last uh, twelve <laughs> years, uh, we haven't done any regionals or central neuroaxial blocks. Uh, my major re reservation would be uh, maintenance of uh, systolic blood pressure, and and for that one reason alone, uh, I I wouldn't uh, particularly use it. Uh, and I know there are other things around. Uh, uh, coagulation that needs to be monitored, uh, which would be an uh, implication as well. Uh, so, yeah, I, I personally uh, don't use it at all. So we used to use uh, epidural, uh, I think, more than 10 years back as routinely for uh, renal transplants. We used to put it off uh, before induction of anesthesia, and then we would continue with the post-operative pain relief. But then in a patient or in two patients, we had uh, you know, uh, paraplegia sort of. Mm -hmm. So, which took a lot of time to recover. It did recover, but then, they, and one of them was an international patient. I think it was Dr. Viji's patient. And then after that, we completely discontinued using epidural for all our transplant surgeons. So, that was my experience. But earlier, we used to routinely use it. Yeah. And I think one of the issues with epidurals in other surgeries as well has gone down a lot. And uh, main thing is that even if you are using low concentration opioid, well, uh, local anesthetic opioids, you still do see some amount of hypertension. You end up giving them more fluids, uh, which might be good for a post-transplant patient if they're passing urine. Yeah. Uh, but uh, hypertension, treating hypertension, and uh, one of the one problem we have in UK is that these patients need to go into the monitored area. So the you know. Uh, the blood pressure and then epidural monitoring their neurology. Uh, so they are more labor intensive as well compared to just giving a, a PCA to these patients along with some blocks. Okay. So uh, now coming to analgesia in a different form. So opioids, how can opioids be used in these end-stage renal disease, re renal transplant patients? which one to use, how to go about using it, and uh, following that, any opioid sparing techniques that we can talk about, Dr. Ashish? Yeah, thank you, ma'am. And uh, I think uh, I have a lot of bias for the use of opioids, and I do use them routinely in my practice. Considering an end-stage renal disease and CK, CKD patient, uh, more depending on the centers, we use fentanyl, which start with induction, then others could be sufentanyl or alfentanyl or emifentanyl. Now the question comes is, when do we use morphine? So actually what we are bothered about is the renal excretion of morphine, 6 uh, glucronide, and uh, around about 20% to 30% is excreted by the kidneys. So if you don't have a good graft function, you don't have a good urine output, then morphine can create an issue and uh, practically does it. That's another question. 
So uh, most of the people in my center would like to give morphine once the graft is working well. We have good diuresis. Some of them would like to extubate the patient and give morphine. At a personal level, I use uh, morphine a little more liberally, maybe after the vascular anastomosis is done. And I still uh, find it to be uh, the best uh, opioid which is ever available in the history of anesthesia. But uh, considering that, the opioid sparing effects uh, blocks could be tap block and erectospiny blocks, which we do studied in our center. There were some recipients where they were put and ultimately... Uh, we came to a conclusion that, yes, they could reduce the uh, dose of morphine post-operatively, but uh, statistically did not found out to be very significant. And to control post-op pain, then we have been using PCA fentanyl as of now recently. So that's my take on the opioids use on intraoperative analgesia. So uh, what is the non-depolarizing muscle relaxant of choice? in a case of renal transplant. Uh, Dr. Atish? Uh, yes, ma'am. And why would you choose? Which, which one would you choose and why? Ma'am, uh, like uh, we usually uh, use Atra or Cisatra because this uh, these two go through the Hoffman elimination and in uh, chronic kidney diseases also there is no effect a very minimal effect with the half-life also in both atracurium and cis-atracurium. Like uh, Dr. Ashi said earlier, uh, succinylcholine can be used only if the potassium uh, levels allow us to. And uh, But along with this, if required, procurinium and vacurinium also can be used. Now, uh, with the atracurium, uh, we use uh, generally use intermittent boluses uh, some in some of the cases we did use start using the uh, continuous infusion forms uh, in long surgeries and uh, but uh, literature says that in we have discontinued this practice because in it has sh been shown that uh, in long surgeries the in these patients in chronic kidney disease patients the lordosin that uh, gets accumulated uh, because of the atra uh, does is much more and so the neurotoxicity uh, has been shown. We haven't seen it practically, but literature says so. And so we have discontinued this practice and we generally use intermittent boluses of atracurium. Uh, it works well. So I guess the laudosin thing happens when it is continued for more than 24 to 48 hours when you're you know, planning to do some elective ventilation or not. Maybe a couple of that, hours, it might that not. Is for, that's that is for normal see. patients usually, but uh, yeah. some studies have shown that in CKD patients in end-stage renal uh, CKD5, the lodosin gets accumulated much more quicker. Okay. Maybe about five to six hours of infusion, uh, the accumulation is much more. Okay. So, and cetera, curium is the safest. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. okay, now coming to the best part of this topic is crystalloids. This has been a you know matter of debate since time immemorial. So which is the best and what is the consensus and what should be used in renal transplant? Dr. Ashish? Yeah, I think ma'am, this is the most uh, maybe the most studied, the most debated, the, which crystalloid to be used. So traditionally, we have all used uh, normal saline and we have been using it for long. In my center, we still use normal saline, though we have a shift in policy of using lactated ringer and plasma light as of now. And uh, that was after a few studies were done in my own uh, department. And we looked up the literature, then uh, Cochrane Review in 2016 brought this uh, aspect in the perspective. And it looked at normal saline versus low chloride content uh, fluids. So what we are bothered with normal saline is hypercholeremic acidosis. And if you look at plasma light or ringer lactate with balanced salt solutions, we will find this chloride level to be less. What we achieve by using normal saline is we don't add to the potassium load. But again, statistically, this is not found to be significant if you consider a use of plasma light or ringer lactate. What we could do is that up to a certain extent for maybe about two liters, uh, the normal saline could be used could mix and match with plasma light or ringer lactate or just use plasma light. And uh, till now, 
there, there has been no consensus as of now. But if you look at the graft dysfunction or the graft function post-operatively, or if you look at the potassium levels, they are not found to be significantly different with either choice of crystalloids. Thank you. Dr. Viji, you want to add in something? Okay. I think she, she is offline. Okay. Uh, Dr. Yeah. So we routinely Dr. use uh, balanced crystalloid. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah. So we routinely use balanced crystalloid. We, we did use to use no saline in the past. Uh, but uh, we changed practice after mm. uh, probably reviewing some uh, small studies that uh, compared um, normal saline versus balanced crystalloid sort of uh, for uh, live transplant patients. Uh, but on the basis of that, we, we moved uh, and now we use it for all our transplants, including cadaverics. Now, the only time uh, we would switch from uh, balance uh, crystalloid to normal saline is if the patient has symptomatic hyperkalemia that we are treating uh, perioperatively. Uh, in those uh, cases, uh, just for governance reasons mainly, uh, when the patient's handed over to either the transplant ward uh, or to another team, we feel that having uh, normal saline is safer uh, to uh, provide no other reason for uh, hyperkalemia. If uh, the patient's managed in a critical care setting uh, under anesthetist, I think you can carry on with uh, uh, balanced uh, crystalloid uh, because the monitoring is much better and you can sample uh, blood gases. Right. Thank you. Okay. What about colloids? The role of colloids in the renal transplant, <laughs> natural or synthetic? natural like albumin. Uh, Dr. Atish? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, like uh, we already spoke about that for renal transplant, crystalloids are the main thing. Colloids are only to be used to maintain the hemodynamic goals like uh, the patient is bleeding, hypotensive, and you do not have blood. Just for the temporary uh, thing, uh, we can use colloids. And uh, even in colloids, Albumin can be used, but uh, albumin is considerably very expensive and the cost is a hindrance to the use of albumin. Uh, the role of gelatins and dextrins is still not clearly established and they should be used with uh, caution. While uh, the use of uh, uh, hydroxyethyl starch is, we do not actually use uh, HES uh, because it causes increased risk of renal failure in critically ill patients. So if to be used albumin, if the cost permits and otherwise uh, for a short duration, ge uh, gelatins can be used. Otherwise, uh, not much of a role of colloids in transplant. Okay, and how does one manage fluid administration? I mean, how much volume to give? How do you assess whether you're giving adequate amount of volume? Which phase of surgery do you actually start giving the fluids? Do you give it as a continuous from when you induce anesthesia or do you give it at certain other point of time? Uh, Dr. Vijay, would you uh, tell me from your experience? And Am I audible? Yeah. So basically, uh, this is one uh, aspect in which there's a lot of variations in, in between uh, uh, anesthetists and in the same institute as well as anesthetists in a different institute. So basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, the aims of fluid management must be two things. You know, you increase the renal blood flow and allow an allograft function. You also you need to avoid underhydration or, or overhydration. So what crystalloids do, do we give it has already been discussed. And how much do we give is a question right now. So I'm going to tell what I practice, ma'am. Can you just go to the next slide, next to next slide? So, yeah. So basically, I sort of divide my patients into two groups. Okay. One with an ejection fraction of less than 35 percentage and some degree of diastolic dysfunction. The other one with an ejection fraction of more than 35 percentage and uh, uh, maybe a grade one or a grade two diastolic dysfunction. So uh, uh, in those with a EF of more than 35, 
uh, and uh, during the vascular bed preparation, I usually give around three to four ml per kg per hour. So if you if we assume uh, that uh, um, you know vascular bed preparation and anastomosis takes around two hours, uh, that would be three into fifty for a fifty kg patient. One fifty ml into two hours, three hundred ml like that. Then we also would give mannitol as well as fluid, as well as uh, solimetrol. So mannitol would be around two bottles or twenty percent. So that would be two hundred ml to two three hundred plus two hundred five hundred ml plus the solimetrol, which was in a hundred ml saline bottle. So in total, uh, by the time the kidney is getting reperfused, I would have given around six hundred ml of fluid. Plus around three minutes before reperfusion, I start off. I start increasing my rate of fluid, and once the urine is produced, uh, I replace urine uh, at a ratio of one is to one. Now the most important thing over here is that you need to communicate with the surgeon because uh, I mean uh, uh, he or she can feel the kidney, can say whether the kidney is too soft or whether the kidney is too hard. Uh, look at the color of the kidney, and the kidney should be pink. He can say whether the uh, vena cava is well filled or is underfilled, and uh, he or she can also say whether the whether the patient is producing urine. So these are a few things uh, uh, which I uh, you know which which I do uh, which I do so that uh, uh, you know I have a good communication with the surgeon and increase or decrease the fluid uh, 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 you know uh, uh, according to the feedback which I get from the surgeon. Now, so that is for patients who have who have a, a relatively well preserved heart. Now, those in which there is severe uh, systolic as well as diastolic dysfunction, I would consider minimally invasive cardiac output monitoring if there, if it is available. Usually, I don't give any IV fluid till reperfusion, except of course mannitol as well as solimetrol would go. So that would be around three hundred ml. And if there is hypotension at that time, I would sort of give small boluses of around 5 ml per kg and reassess the chemodynamics. Also, uh, once the urine starts coming, I would uh, maybe increase the uh, uh, fluid to around uh, 1 is to 1 uh, ratio. I start replacing at around 1 is to 1 and then consider putting the patient on diuretics. So my practice sort of varies depending upon the ejection fraction and the diastolic dysfunction. If the, if the heart is sort of well preserved, I sort of give fluids a bit more liberally and if the heart is sort of uh, uh, as heart as it has or a systolic dysfunction, I'm a bit more conservative and sort of uh, try to put the patients on diuretics as early as possible. Possible. So that's my uh, take on this. Thank you. Okay. Any anyone wants to add in anything? So a patient who is having a preemptive transplant and is already producing so it is very important to know how much the urine how much urine the uh, you know the uh, patient is producing so if the patient is already producing 1 liter or something we can relax and you yeah. know start yeah, giving fluids and uh, if yeah, and many of them with preemptive transplant have had a single hemodialysis just prior to you know to decrease the acidosis or whatever so in yeah. those patients we can start off immediately uh, following induction of anesthesia but in the others, which Vijay, you've already said in the, you know, high risk ones who are ejection fraction ones, we need to, you know, give it later. Dr. Ajay? Uh, yeah, can I just add that these yeah. kidneys, uh, even if it is uh, best of the well-preserved living donor transplant uh, donor kidney or the cadaveric kidneys, which do suffer varying degree of ischemic insult, they always have tubular defects. So if the kidney is perfused well, it should start passing urine. If it is not passing urine, it is not due to any furosemide uh, or any uh, diuretic deficiency. Sorry to be using this kind of expression. So mm -hmm. I would say that uh, we have been trained in a way that not to use diuretic at any time, unless you can call, you know, manitol for its diuretic effect. Uh, but that is, a, uh, that is because of antioxidant effect we are using it. So uh, we, in CRISP course also, we emphasize that uh, in surgical patient, make them volumic, supply the kidney with well oxygenated uh, blood with good cardiac output. And that's all we, uh, as a surgeon, as a critical care specialist, or as an SRS, we can do. So yeah. we avoid uh, giving furosemide or any diuretic because it is more often than not counterproductive. And it would not increase the 
it will not improve the kidney function. So that is my comment. Thank you. Dr. Ashish, so uh, Dr. Ajay has already mentioned a bit about diuretics. So yeah. what do you say about the role of diuretics intraoperatively, whether it is, you know, prusamide or it is mannitol? What would you prefer to use? How much do you use and when do you use it? So uh, as Dr. Ajay commented, so what are what are the diuretics we are looking at? To be 20% mannitol and furosemide. And over a period of time, uh, I have seen the institutional protocol in a different way that uh, one uh, of the unit was not using any of the diuretics. Then one has been using mannitol and one has been using mannitol plus furosemide. What uh, we actually look at is the use and the utility of mannitol and does the literature support it. And we are all uh, concerned about the IR, the ischemic reperfusion injury and Manitol could be a kind of a kidney protector that as uh, the rational would be free radical scavenger or reducing the graft swelling as well as producing post-operative diuresis. Some studies have documented that the incidence of uh, ARF and the delayed graft function as well as the decrease in the post-operative creatinine levels has been much of a benefit by the use of manitol. But still, the evidence is lacking and more so with furosemide. And my take of it is mostly it is a surgical dogma or it's a surgical uh, also a kind of a difference of opinion where many surveys have been done where centers from about 65% to 70% have been using the diuretics, the rest of them don't use it. And where exactly they use it is just before the time of reperfusion when they remove the clamps or maybe a little bit uh, earlier than that. How much we use it is mannitol may be taken up as uh, between uh, 0.5 to 1 milligram per kg. And uh, I would always, uh, I also would support the idea of not use of diuretics, but that's with a pinch of salt and maybe it is not in my purview at the moment. Thank you. Actually, diuretics, many a times it's the surgeon who tells us to, you know, uh, start using it and put the patient on the prusamide yeah. infusion or something. So, although we all agree on mannitol, but prusamide is, I think, majorly dictated by the surgeon. Yeah. yeah. So, some surgeons just don't use it and some surgeons love to use it and they go, you know, to two milligrams per kg of it. And so, okay. Basopressors, inotropes. So, which one should one use during renal transplant? You know, we have so many of them. Dopamine is one, again, which has been really talked about. Dr. Atish, can you uh, just uh, highlight what you do and what can be done? Ma'am, uh, in uh, because in, in this transplant, uh, hypotension is mainly to be avoided uh, by the the maintaining the intravascular volume as such uh, administration of uh, vasopressors is really not required very much the hypotension can be taken care of by careful mm -hmm. titration of the agents and maintaining the uh, intravascular volume <laughs> while if we have to use uh, vasopressors then in infusion form noradrenaline is, is usually the first choice while we can also give uh, temporary intermittent boluses of ephedrine to, uh, for temporary use and if it's temporary hypotension and the hypotension comes up with the fluid and all those things. So ephedrine can be used intermittently, but if we need to uh, put in an infusion, then an order, noradrenaline is usually the first choice. And uh, like you said, the role of dopamine is very controversial and because literature has innumerable uh, articles on the role of dopamine. Some say it is uh, renoprotective and all those things, but um, no such studies, uh, meta-analysis have shown that uh, there is no renal uh, protection as such with the uh, dopamine. So role of dopamine is uh, still very controversial and we usually do not use uh, dopamine. We uh, maximally use uh, noradrenaline and ADR can be used in like very safe patients with uh, ejection fraction of very low, uh, like those patients. But usually NORAD is the uh, infusion of first choice. So noradrenaline and monitoring the mean arterial 
pressure is something i mean that would sort of dictate a, as to how much of noradrenaline we should use i think to some extent and dopamine again controversial because uh, denervated kidney is being put and whether it has any role or not one doesn't know okay yeah uh, dr shiv dr ajay anyone wants to add dr nirmal nirmal any any other uh, suggestions mm -hmm. I'd agree uh, with the with the choice. Uh, you obviously uh, fluids first before uh, vasopressors, inotropes, uh, but we're, we're limited. There, there is no good drug choice, really. So I think uh, NORAD is uh, probably the best bet. Dr. Ajay? Yeah, it is slightly embarrassing for me to speak after such an expert uh, that Nimal, Daniel, and Shiv Singh are. Uh, well, uh, regarding the fluid, doesn't matter whatever fluid we use, uh, as long as we are doing it as quickly as possible to make them euvolemic. Having said making them euvolemic, many of these patients, uh, just because of renal failure, and in some patients added to that uh, due to diabetes, they would have autonomic neuropathy. And also because of atherosclerotic disease, all these reasons are there that their euvolemic, you know, the euvolemic range that they can really, uh, they do have is much narrower than uh, uh, normal people. So it is, uh, not only it is tricky to assess their euvolemic state. Uh, of course, patients are very good in telling, oh, doctor, I don't have much fluid now. Uh, or they, you know, I'm not explaining here how to assess volumic, euvolemic stage, you know. But all I'm trying to say is that assessing their and uh, achieving their Euvolemic stage is very crucial. Regarding use of uh, dopamine, uh, we have never asked for it. And when we were mentioning about the uh, uh, diuretic, uh, it is often the surgeons who really keep demanding, oh, can we have some uh, diuretics uh, rather than the anesthetist advising it? So uh, regarding the dopamine, as we know, in physiology books, we studied, uh, well, it does have renal uh, effect at, at a higher level. It would have... Uh, you know, the beta and alpha agonist, beta uh, and alpha agonist effect. So uh, there are a small group of patients who tend to have lower blood pressure consistently, and we ask for their 48 hours blood pressure monitoring. But after taking very balanced decision in MDTs, if some of those saying, they say, okay, we, they don't have much significant cardiac issue, but their blood pressure tends to remain low. We would, especially uh, for them, ask for a place in POCU, post-operative, uh, uh, you know, uh, recovery area. And in those patients, select a small number of patients, they would require cardiovascular monitoring. They would require uh, some inotropic support for two days, sometimes for three days, so that if there was their kidney gets going, then it is not really a problem. So only in very select group of patients, we have needed to request for POCU and thereby uh, you know, for their using of use of vasoactive agents, and even over there, we have you seen norad being used rather than dopamine. Uh, so that is my uh, observation and uh, some uh, use of you know applied physiology principles. So as I said, that I'm really quoting from the experience because I'm a experiential learner. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so now soda bike. I mean, uh, these patients, they are on inotropes and they are acidotic and sometimes, you know, uh, we have to tackle the acidosis. So what is to be done? When should we use soda bicarb? What is the initiating targets for using soda bicarb? Should we at all use soda bicarb? Dr. Vijay Shankar? Yeah, very controversial topic. Uh, now, uh, uh, I'm just going to talk from my experience. So, basically, metabolic acidosis is sort of very common, okay? I mean, uh, it's got most of the patients of CKD5 will be having a degree of metabolic acidosis. And uh, with metabolic acidosis, it has, studies have shown that renal function sort of declines faster. Uh, there are some centers which, which start uh, oral bicarb therapy, even if the bicarbonated levels are less than 20. So uh, if you go to the next slide, there's a meta-analysis which I could find out. And uh, they compared a lot of studies and uh, they found 
uh, so they were looking at oral the supplementation of oral bicarb uh, uh, the role of oral bicarb in, in delaying the progression of CKD and when these patients were on oral bicarbs the, the 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 progression was much slower bicarbonate uh, metabolic acidosis by itself has has um, basically systemic consequences uh, to be specific with respect to kidney it causes an arteriolar uh, 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 dilatation and a, and a venal constriction so basically you have a good inflow and a bad outflow. So typically what happens is that when there is severe metabolic acidosis, the surgeon says that the kidney is sort of uh, tense. Now, what is have, has any studies been done uh, which looked at the role of soda bicarb in renal transplant? I could just find one single study in which uh, 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 they divided into two groups, 60 patients per group. Uh, uh, the first group, they started uh, soda bicarb if the base excess was less than minus 5. And in the second group, they started sort of back up. The base excess was less than minus 10. And they found that uh, with, with a tight, tighter control of uh, metabolic acidosis, the serum creatinine level was much lower. The, so this is about the early graft dysfunction. So the early graft dysfunction incidence was much lower if you had a, a tighter control of metabolic acidosis. But this, this, didn't, this didn't translate to a, a, a better, uh, you know, uh, uh, graft su survival in the post-operative period. What about uh, metabolic acidosis? Does surgery worsen metabolic acidosis? There has been a large uh, uh, a study done in, uh, in the Bradford Anesthetic Department. It was around 1,200 cases. And uh, again, ma'am, if, if you can go to the next slide. So they have found out that with induction of anesthesia, the metabolic acidosis sort of increases. Like if you look at this slide, by the eighth hour of anesthesia, the, the, the rate of metabolic acidosis is actually much higher and metabolic acidosis tends to, uh, you know, come down uh, in the post-operative uh, period. So this was done in, uh, in not in uh, the renal transplant patients, but in patients who were undergoing vascular surgeries and also in patients who are undergoing uh, major abdominal surgeries. So there are adverse effects of soda bicarb also, like you have expansion of intravascular volume, hypernatremia and raised ICP. So what I feel is that, uh, and, uh, you know, in my experience, I tend to favor the use of soda bicarb. So what do I do? I plan to keep a base excess of more than minus five as far as possible. Now, since soda bicarb causes an increase in intravascular volume and most of our patients are compromised hearts, I tend to avoid boluses as much as possible. So I look at the blood gas. If the base excess is less than minus four, that means that the bicarb level is hovering somewhere around 90 to 20, I start an infusion of soda bicarb at around 20 to 20 milligrams per hour. I do a blood gas uh, uh, prior to reperfusion and titrate my soda bicarb levels uh, depending upon the base excess at that particular point. If you have severe metabolic acidosis uh, with a hemodynamic compromise, I do give bolus of soda bicarb, but if the heart is weak, I do give incremental boluses like you know 25 ml per hour. So no, not 25 ml per hour, 25 ml boluses. So uh, that is what I follow uh, with regards to soda bicarb. I am a bit, uh, I, I use soda bicarb and I, I think I tend to start soda bicarb a bit earlier than most people. So that is my take on that. Dr. Shiv, Dr. Nirmal, anyone else? We, we don't use uh, sodium bicarb uh, uh, on a routine basis, uh, but uh, uh, only used if there's severe metabolic acidosis, as Dr. Vijay has mentioned. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Vijay, are you there? Yeah, hi. Uh, Soda bicarb, yes, two, two times, two things. One is, uh, you know, i sorry to say that, usually all anesthetic, uh, when you do an ABG, you're all on the acidotic side rather than on the alkalotic side. So yeah, I think that's how anesthesia is normally, I assume. So uh, added to that, we have a, a, a uremic patient who has all the fixed acids accumulated in his body. Though he's been dialyzed the day before, it's never a complete removal of all the fixed acids in the body. So the, in times of hypotension, where there is quite a amount of acidosis that we definitely need to, to, to replace them. And so one is acidosis, the other thing is when hyperkalemia is there. You know, time and again, 
you know this happens especially in the well built guys uh, you know those who gym etc with security dialysis or this heavy meat eaters these are the two people where i get you know, they've been dialyzed the night before but still they end up having hyperkalemia potassium of 5 5.5 so kind of so these patients if they start on low dose stomach uh, uh, infusion plus you know k bind rectal you and then take them up for surgery so when they have hyperkalemia they always have an added acidosis as well so so yes may not everybody but yes most of the times especially if you do an abg after reperfusion you find most of them are acidotic at least 80 85% of them so either they compensate it with uh, mechanical ventilation wonderful you don't want to give by cup i'm okay with it but uh, normalize u volemia like that u ph normalize ph to 7.35 at least okay so uh during reperfusion how do we prepare ourselves i mean what should one know and how do we go ahead to prepare for reperfusion dr ashish yeah i i think i also agree with vijay in uh, being on the edge preparing for maintaining the bicarb i'm a, quite a proponent of using bicarb and the next uh, i think this question answers my uh, thought process how do you prepare for reperfusion so what we are basically bothered is the ir or the ischemic reperfusion injury and uh, in a kidney transplant where uh, maybe more so in a cadaveric yeah. than a living donor when the clamps come off so what are we actually looking at i need a blood pressure which should be having at least a mean arterial pressure at that time to be more than 90 uh, have a blood gas in hand look at whether the acidosis is there treated well at that time most basically looking at a, uh, the normal parameters would make me happy keep the calcium and bicarb ready plus do a fluid lo- loading so normally what i would follow is to keep a cvp between 12 to 15 and give a little boluses of fluids so they are not short of fluid once the clamps are off are off the hypotension can happen either due to bleeding or due to acidosis and hyperkalemia so maintain the sugar levels also to be within normal and an fio2 of 100% this could be controversial but that's what uh, i would do to prepare for reperfusion thank you okay so uh now uh, coming to transfusion i mean so uh, there are these patients do have coagulopathy and some they are you know they are anemic they have a low hemoglobin so uh, does one have to routinely give some blood transfusion or platelet or ffp and if so when and how do we you know uh, do this dr vijay shankar yeah so the answer to the question in short is no huh? so uh, basically because you know uh, anemia is very common in ckd and by the time they are in stage 5 uh, uh, or more than half of the patients are anemic so do we actually uh, if you have a patient with ckd who is being planned for uh, for renal transplantation one of the things which we want to avoid is allo sensitization so there are empty number of studies in which patients have been given preoperative transfusion to for the anemia and it has been associated with decreased uh, uh, graft function post operatively so routine transfusion of uh, prcs is not recommended at least pre operatively uh, you we can correct anemia by means of iron supplementation or by means of erythropoietin now what do we do in drop again uh, uh, we avoid pre operative tra- pre intraoperative transfusion as much as possible now uh, as long as the hemoglobin over somewhere around 7 g per deciliter i would be comfortable if the hemoglobin falls below 7 or somewhere around 6 then i would consider transfusion and uh, always when you are considering when you doing uh, intraoperative transfusion make sure that your uh, prcs are or uh, uh, wbc depleted prcs uh, we don't use autologous transfusion uh, much in our center but if you have a cell saver there yeah, then maybe we could use autologous transfusion so that is with regards to uh, you know uh, prc what about platelets uremia causes platelet dysfunction everyone knows that uh, 
and platelet dysfunction may not be apparent in platelet numbers, but if you do platelet function assays, there may be a, a decrease in the, there may be a qualitative uh, defect in the platelets. Uh, again, platelet transfusion has been found to be ineffective in these patients. If these patients manifest with bleeding, now bleeding is most frequently as GI bleeding or as skin bleeding. If these patients manifest as bleeding, we can give IV desmopressin preoperatively. That being said, there is some sort of a coagulation paradox which happens in CKD. Now, on one hand, we, we have thrombocytopathies, anemia, thrombocytopenia, and increased uh, protein C. And on the, on the other hand, studies have shown that these patients have an increased von Willebrand factor, increased tissue factor, increased fibrinogen levels, which tend to tip the scale towards uh, uh, hypercoagulability. So we can't really say that a CKD patient is hypercoagulable. They can be hypercoagulable. They can be hypercoagulable as well. There has been one study which I could find. That was a Chinese study. I couldn't find the entire article, but the abstract was in English, and it said that uh, uh, they looked at around uh, uh, 200 odd patients with chronic kidney disease, and around 70 percentage of these patients had some degree of hypercoagulability, as evidenced by the tech. There was one more study which I found in around 12,000 odd patients, uh, which looked at uh, bleeding versus thrombotic uh, tendencies in patients with CKD. What did they find out? Patients with CKD had a uh, had lot of bleeding manifestations, which is right, uh, but the the amount of uh, uh, fatal bleeding manifestations was way more lesser than the amount of fatal thromboembolic manifestations, which uh, 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 which uh, uh, leads me to believe that these patients do have a prothrombotic tendency. So now, because of this prothrombotic tendency, do we use intraoperative anticoagulation? Routinely, we don't usually use intraoperative anticoagulation. If the thromboelostogram shows a degree of hypercoagulability and the, and the uh, person gets really worried about what's forming on the, uh, uh, after anastomosis, then we do use anticoagulation. What anticoagulation can be used? If we can use either unfractionated heparin, we can use the usual dose, but I sort of uh, tend to underdose these patients a bit. So instead of giving an 80 units per kg, I sort of give around 30 to 40 units per kg. If you're using low molecular weight heparin, and uh, I would go for a 30 50% reduction in dose of low molecular weight heparin. So that is my take off, uh, take on uh, intraoperative transfusion and uh, intraoperative anticoagulation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, many centers use, uh, you know, they give a bit of heparin just before, uh, you know, reperfusion. Reperfusion, yes. Yeah. So I don't think we use it, but uh, Dr. Nirmal. Dr. Ajay, I mean, I mean, Dr. Shiv, do, do you use it over there? Because we, we, our transplant surgeons don't tell us to give heparin. Uh, we, we don't tend to use uh, any parenteral heparin. Uh, maybe AJ can uh, advise. Uh, I believe that the surgeons use diluted heparin uh, whilst uh, they are implanting. Dr. Viji, are you there? Yeah, maybe yeah. I can maybe I can come yeah, in uh, while. Oh, yeah. Ajay, Ajay. Yes, oh, no, no, let Vijay let Vijay come in. <laughs> let no, start. after you, Prof. No problem. <laughs> okay, if you say so. Uh, we tend to use uh, give them uh, fragment or uh, two, two and a half thousand in the series or Klexin, twenty milligrams. These are just when they are leaving for uh, theater, and that's all. Is the anticoagulation we give them. Uh, Occasionally, some surgeons, they tend to ask for two and a half thousand years of uh, heparin, IV, if they are going to, if the surgeon is going to uh, anastomose a small blood vessel, like one millimeter blood vessel, because the risk of thrombosis is higher than that. Uh, but some other surgeons, uh, they object to that because they say that the risk of bleeding is higher in them and the risk of uh, taking them to theater for hematoma is higher. So uh, this, this is just a variation in the approach. Yeah, but uh, two and a half thousand of fragment or 20 milligrams of uh, collection subcutaneous in all the patients before they leave for theater. That is the only anticoagulation we use as a standard. Dr. Viji? Uh, pediatric transplants, yes, I definitely use. 
and uh, don't use routinely. Otherwise, in the perfusing fluid, we add it to the perfusing fluid about a thousand units. So usually with that itself, and because these people have been sort of not very well dialyzed, so they tend to actually be oozy rather than uh, so uh, you know ulimic platelets, etc. So basically, I don't routinely use. I use it in pediatrics. Second, I use a, a small unit of 500 or 1,000 units before clamping the uh, internal. I use on internal, uh, you know, before clamping the vessel so that uh, it remains the circulation. And of course, in diabetics, and of course, in those with uh, uh, with uh, with the SLE or something, when we are when we are having patients with thrombotic tendency. The thrombotic tendency we definitely use. Okay. Okay, then we you. small dose top along with the flexane later to follow. Okay, so I think flexane later to follow I routinely is used. You know, you know, this this small teeny weeny one thousand unit is is just for the drop, and then as they leave the theater, we give the remake the flexane point two or point four. Okay. Depending okay, on the size of the patient. Okay. So now, uh, following the surgery, getting over, uh, most of these patients, we don't continue with ventilation. I mean, they usually extubated, the anesthesia is reversed and shifted to the ICU, renal care unit. So, but in which patients do we continue with elective ventilation? How do we assess that and how, how do we, you know, decide whether we want to continue with elective ventilation. Dr. Ashish? Yeah, I think uh, more than 95% of these patients, which uh, we do or maybe in any other center, would be extubated, go into the uh, PACU and then move on to the ICU for monitoring. But uh, some patients we do get caught up and it could be a decreased graft function. There would be an acute rejection, which might happen on table, which has happened once with me. So you have a decreased urine output and the acidosis is climbing. You have inotropes, which are going a little bit on the wayward towards a little higher side, subsequently leading to fluid overload and ultimately leading to something which we uh, all anesthetists face that is inadequate reversal. So all these parameters and uh, uh, could uh, make us decide that we need to electively ventilate this patient there might be incidences of uh, great volume loss or a bleeding loss that has happened and we had need to replace it. That could also happen. And in a rare event of a stress-induced cardiomyopathy or refractory vasoplegia due to some element of sepsis, which might become evident intraoperatively. So these patients do require an elective postoperative ventilation till they stabilize and uh, to be monitored regularly in the ICU. And then once they are up and about, then we remove the tube for them. What is the fluid that we, you know, continue giving in the immediate post-operative period and how do we manage this fluid administration? Uh, Dr. Atish? Uh, so, uh, like I said, it's the same crystalloids that we give in the post-operative uh, period also. So we can either continue with the same crystalloid that we were using intraoperatively and we can continue it post-op also. Uh, in our setup, in many of the cases, we use uh, half normal salines and it has to be 100%. We usually give 100% urine replacement so that there's no hypovolemia because uh, in the initial stages, there is a high level of diuresis. And so we need 100% urine replacement. And for that, we also should be uh, monitoring the urine output strictly. So just these things. So any crystalloid uh, can be used, uh, whatever intraoperatively we were using, that can be used, or half normal saline can also be used. Uh, Dr. Viji, any inputs? I mean, how do we continue with the fluid? Because the GFR rises a lot immediately postoperatively. Okay, I go on to the next. So post-operative analgesia, what is done and how is it managed? Dr. Vijay? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> uh, post-operative analgesia sort of 
varies uh, 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 from institution to institution. What we practice is what I'm going to say. So uh, a couple of factors which are very important in considering uh, post-operative dialysis would be how uh, uh, the patient was preoperatively, how well oriented he was, and secondly, how well the good kidney is behaving after repopulation. Like if the kidney has been uh, uh, producing good amount of urine, there has been a correction of acidosis, then I wouldn't be much worried about if putting the patient on opioids uh, post-operatively. Uh, we uh, have done uh, uh, many cases with tab blocks, and I think tab blocks uh, have, have helped us in decreasing the uh, doses of opioids which we use in the post-operative period. So I'm a proponent, proponent for use, usage of tab blocks. Epidurus is something which I haven't really done, so I can't really comment on that. Regarding NSAIDs, obviously you can't use, but paracetamol can be used. And regarding opioids, so most of the patients, if the uh, if the patients uh, are diuresing well and kidney function seems to be okay immediately post reposition, then I think I would be comfortable with uh, uh, with putting the patient on uh, a fentanyl or a morphine infusion, uh, uh, provided that you know the patients are well monitored uh, with good anesthesia and uh, critical care people around. So I don't think that would be much of a, a problem. So uh, opioids tend to be the uh, the mainstay of post-operative analgesia, at least in my center and uh, in my experience. Okay, now uh, we go on to the pediatric hen's tail renal disease. At this, we'll do it very briefly because I think it's almost two hour, I mean, long time since we've been doing it. So the etiology of of course in uh, the pediatric cases are different. Uh, very different from adults. Pediatrics, actually, end stage renal disease is only seen in 2% and, uh, and less than 5% of renal transplants. The total renal transplants are done in pediatrics. So what is the etiology, Atish? Can you just enumerate yes, the, the differences? The major chunk of the pediatric etiology consists of the congenital anomalies of the kidney and the urinary tract. Uh, this accounts for about 30% of all the pediatric etiology. And other than this, uh, the other things which are the polycystic kidney disease, the nephronophthysis, cystinosis, congenital nephrotic syndrome, oxalosis, uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome, GRAS syndrome. And these are the congenital anomalies. And other than that, the FSGS, the focal segmental glomerulus sclerosis, and the lupus nephritis. So these consist of the major chunk of the pediatric etiology that we usually see. So most of them are congenital anomalies of the kidney and the urinary tract with obstructive nephropathies and and polycystic. Yeah. So and they have, many of them have had uh, you know surgeries during the neonatal and the initial part of the pediatric age group to delay uh, their progression into end stage renal disease. So, uh, Dr. Vijay, can you quickly uh, tell us about how, you know, there are a few pathophysiological differences between the adult and the pediatric, which we need to know to do further management, uh, adjust the differences. Dr. Vijay, uh, we have to unmute yourself. Am I audible now? Yeah. Yeah, so basically, uh, 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 these patients will have, most of these patients will be hypertensive. And uh, hypertension is because of the same reasons in adults, uh, because of sodium retention, RA, system activation, and all those things. And what happens is that the heart, the pediatric hearts may not be able to cope up with the, with the amount of hypertension that these, that these patients have. And uh, uh, they will be having some amount of less ventricular hypertrophy, some amount of myocardial strain, and diastolic dysfunction. With regards to, uh, uh, like one of the etiologies which these patients have, commonly have are the uh, protein loss, uh, loosing syndrome. So there'll be loosing albumin, which can lead the patients to have, uh, uh, you know, fluid overload, pulmonary edema, and, uh, and those sort of respiratory compromises. They will also be having genetic disorders, which are associated with dysplastic lung syndromes, which will decrease their, uh, uh, you know, functional lung capacities, uh, 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 which, which may result in desaturation during uh, uh, induction of anesthesia. Uh, uh, also, they have very, very brittle bones because of their nutritionally deficient. 
also due to reinforced dystrophy. So positioning of these patients should be important. So these are the uh, main differences. Uh, I mean, if I am if I'm being really really uh, you know <coughs> uh, concise, these are the main differences between pediatric and adults uh, with regards to pathogenesis. And uh, the management of these uh, you know small patients for renal transplant. So regarding the induction of anesthesia, I mean, just because of these pathophysiological changes, uh, Dr. Ashish, I mean, would you like to add in something uh, on this? I think uh, I'll just add a couple of points here, as yeah. it is rightly mentioned, that do not ever compromise on the venous axis in a pediatric patient. Yeah. The second thing is that your uh, they are hypertensives, the blood pressure requirements are to their levels, and we may not require the uh, pressure to be maintained at that high level of MAP, but and, uh, we do have to look at the donor's blood pressure. Second thing, we have a big size kidney putting in, in a small, uh, maybe a baby or a small child. So may I would, uh, would not mind keeping a unit of blood ready. And basically, it's all about volume. There might be sudden hypertension after that. And uh, I think rest of the management usually remains the same. The CVP around the same. The inotropes, uh, nor epi would be the best uh, line of defense against any hypertension. And the lastly part of it is, depending on the surgical, uh, what they feel about how the kidney is and how the vasculature is, we might need to anticoagulate. So that's my take on it. So one thing very interesting about the blood pressure strategy, which I found from the literature was, that before reperfusion, you know, till the reperfusion, you can keep a mean arterial pressure of more than 70% of the baseline. And during reperfusion, you keep it around 65 to 100, or you keep it according to the donor's blood pressure, you know, because usually these patients get a kidney from an adult. So, and of course, the fluid management is very important. And uh, again, the blood pressure has to be calibrated along with the mean arterial pressure as I've already said. So the communication with the surgeon becomes very important because it's a big kidney uh, in a small baby. And, uh, you know, there's a major difference in the cardiac output. I mean, adult kidney requires around 500 ml per minute. And, you know, the baby's cardiac output, whether it will be able to cope with that. So, and uh, then, of course, the blood glucose level has to be monitored because, I mean, we cannot, many of them will tend to, you know, the blood plasma glucose level will tend to fall. So that is, we have to give a maintenance glucose infusion. And soda bicarb, again, it is, again, it is given when there is severe acidosis, but, you know, it is made as a, uh, you know, half or one fourth the concentration. Anemia, of course, has to be taken care of. The threshold is a little higher over here. And one should be aware of the donor recipient mismatch, especially in the immediate post-operative period when the GFR is very raised and, you know, initially the cardiac output is increased. Then because of the diuresis, there is hypovolemia. And uh, so uh, one needs to, you know, increase the fluid which is being given and closely monitor the, uh, you know, the urine output and the electrolytes. Anyone uh, would like to add in anything? Dr. Viji is there or Dr. Nirmal? Dr. Viji? Dr. Nirmal? Uh, I have, <laughs> is this a pediatric anesthesia you're asking about? Yeah. Yeah, I, I have. I, actually, we made it in a very short, <laughs> very brief yeah, yeah. way because, you know. Uh, I, I have uh, no practical experience, so okay. I, I can't, I can't add to it, I'm afraid. Ours is an adult, adult center, so we don't do any pediatrics. Okay. So, I think Dr. Viji is gone offline. Yeah, I, I can just add, again, uh, this time it is uh, purely theoretical because uh, of, uh, you know, some experience in Edinburgh, but otherwise uh, I've worked only in p uh, adult centers, adult transplant centers. So, we just need to be aware that uh, when the transplant uh, graft is going there, it would increase the intravascular uh, compartment. So we need to have judicious expansion of intravascular volume. And also it acts like a physiological shunt in kids. So we just need to be aware of that. Yeah. So nothing much to add otherwise. 
so actually initially the gfr increases and then because the heart cannot manage you know perfusing yeah. such a big kidney so there is a bit of ischemic damage to especially to the tubular um, cells in after around yeah. 24 to 48 hours and the other thing is sometimes in the uh, pediatric age group because if they are small babies the anastomosis is done not to the iliacs but to the aorta and the ivc so that is another thing it is actually done you know in in the anastomosis is done there so that's it yeah. i think yeah, uh, yeah. the kidneys so, plays intraabdominally as you mentioned yeah. Yeah. and uh, rather than a continuous suture we would use interrupted sutures there and in pre transplant uh, workup we just have to make sure that there is no uh, you know where we are planning to anastomose those vessels are not thrombosed and yeah. The urine outflow has been assessed carefully. That's yeah. all. Yeah. And many a times the kidney has to be taken out before the transplant surgery, you know, in the polycystic kidneys or in the nephrotic syndrome babies. So this is another thing we should be aware yeah, of. Yeah, that, that I would say that uh, if a patient needs native nephrectomy, whatever the age of a patient is, it should really be done as a separate procedure. Yeah. Because at the time of transplant, we really want to keep the patient in pure, in best of the physiological state. And which may not be because there's no operation like native nephrectomy, which is without complication. Or even if everything has gone fine, they're likely to be post-operative paralytic alias. And that is enough to make the perioperative management complex. So one should give a gap of six weeks if the patient needs native nephrectomy and a transplant whatever the age. Okay. Thank you, sir. That was very informative. So I think we can end the symposium with the, on this note. Dr. Shiv? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, thank you uh, very much, uh, Chitra, Atish, Ashish, Vijay, uh, Nirmal, and uh, Ajay from that. And of course, Vijay uh, joining us. Yeah. I mean, this has been an excellent uh, symposium. Uh, we did actually, I think, uh, miss out a few things, uh, which I think um, uh, Nirmal will agree with us. We have had quite a few critical incidents uh, related to the administration of anti-rejection drugs. And the, we are very particular about uh, who administered it, how it is uh, you know, documented. And, and that's, that's been one thing. The other thing is, I think, uh, Obviously, I mean, this was a short time for discussing everything. Is other other is that we do actually, uh, Anirmal does do uh, pre ops uh, for some of these patients who are, uh, you know, have a lot of medical problems, comorbidity, as you've all discussed. I mean, there are comorbidities. So there is input from the anesthetic side, uh, and Anirmal does a pre op clinic for, for us. For that. Uh, I, don't, I don't actually do a pre-op clinic, but, but I, 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 advise the surgeons, <laughs> yeah. I, I advise the surgeons on uh, selected cases. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's impossible to see everybody, <laughs> which is a challenge. No, because I do actually see uh, some of your pre-ops uh, for, especially even before they come for the transplant for vascular access, they do continue. So that's why <laughs> I was saying that. I, I mean, you do it on your own time, so that's that's different. There's no you know, official kind of pre-op clinic for that. But anti-rejection drugs thing, I think uh, we can uh, probably just discuss it on the group sometime. Yeah. Um, so uh, in our practice, anti-rejection... Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, anti so anti-rejection drugs, usually, you know, it's managed again by the nephrologist and the surgeon and... Uh, we are not really actively involved in, you know, deciding. So we follow what they tell us to do. Right. So, uh, yeah. Chitra, you want to stop sharing then and uh, we can actually then uh, come to yeah. all the faculty. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, I think we just need to take out all the spotlights. Yeah. Right. Um, I said, uh, thank you, thank you for this wonderful uh, symposium. And there were a few comments, um, and this was related to, I think, pain management. Uh, is it can we use intrathecal morphine with very low dose local anesthetic for analgesia? Anybody doing that? We haven't done it, no. Intrathecal, yeah. no. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, our we uh, can. Sorry, what is the question, Shiv? I for I it's, missed. It's listening. about uh, intrathecal morphine. Just low dose sorry. intrathecal morphine, like sorry. it's been sorry, used. I should comment on that. Oh. Um, and, uh, now that's. Uh, I think we don't. We our all patients go on uh, renal PCA. Um, uh, post op. And like I said, uh, it's a combination of regional anesthesia and uh, and a renal PCA. Uh, but otherwise, I think some of the people, there is one comment where I say that this is Alka Dio, I don't know where she is from, and she says we use erector spinae catheters for post-operative analgesia. Erector spinae has been in controversy. If you look at the Twitter, there is a group who is it's against yeah. it, there is some for it. Um, I think it works quite well for thoracic cases. I won't actually say it's the best for abdominal. Yeah, not for yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. If I were to go, like I said, I would obviously go for tap and rather go for posterior tap, uh, like the cordatus lumbar or transversal spatial block. Uh, otherwise, the tap is the easiest to give and you know the most effective. Most effective, right, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And we're not looking at absolute analgesia. here. We just, it's yeah. part of the multimodal analgesia here to yeah. reduce the other requirements for that. Uh, Mohit had actually had messaged um, the chat and he said that he was, Mohit, you can come in if you want. Hello, sir. Yeah, hi. Uh, sorry to join the session here. My Facebook Live was not working actually. No problem at all. <laughs> yeah. So we, we are regularly doing uh, this uh, tab blocks and QL blocks for this, and they are showing us excellent results. So we are doing at, around uh, 12 to 14 transplants a month. So they are working excellent. Uh, in between our transplant program, got a little there were some uh, issues with the uh, licensing and all, and started again, and we are doing excellent with these blocks. I think they, they are very useful, the blocks. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Dr. Hemant uh, also had joined us. I don't know whether he's still there or not. And he had made a few uh, comments about, well, obviously he did ask about the use of uh, Eprin, which Nirmal had already answered that question. Uh, and then we had discussed about the use of anticoagulants. And then he had also asked about how about FFP as a colloid for transfusion instead of albumin? Does anybody do anybody use? I, I wouldn't think so. worried. FFP with all the antibodies and yeah. in spite of the fantastic results, yeah. it's fantastic blood banks that we have now, but I think we should, you know, definitely not use. And the infection and everything not use unless we want to do plasma pheresis and in these patients when we are doing ABO incompatible or something like that. So other than that, using FFPs, I don't, we've never used it. Absolutely. I think uh, that's true. I think and also, I mean, you have, like you mentioned, there are coagulation factors as well. And the last thing you want is increase thrombosis for whatever reason. Not that it's going to cause thrombosis as such, but I don't think we need to actually use that. And plasma expansion, I think most of us are happy with using crystalloids. And that's where the world is going towards. Yeah. Uh, crystalloids, uh, the colloids, I think uh, all these starches and uh, gels, they're out of the I think, equation completely. Yeah. Uh, anything anybody wants to add before we actually end the session? So it's been almost more than two and a half hour session. And I think it's really uh, absolutely long. wonderful. And uh, Nirmal has actually just attended just our first session. We have done quite a few. Nirmal, what do you think? <laughs> How did it go? Are you muted? Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah. I, I think it was an excellent session. Uh, and what one can take from it is although there's uh, lots of science behind it, uh, there is much of a feel to the anesthetist, uh, which is involved with many of the issues, you know, patient assessment, fluid management, knowing which patient should receive what care. I think all of that, uh, it's, it's hard to educate, uh, but uh, it's, it's more of a field specialty, I think. And the, the more you work uh, with the transplant team on a regular basis, you get to know these patients are they're quite difficult uh, to manage. Uh, and the, the challenge is uh, trying to feed the need that patients have to have a transplant. And we all know that it is probably the best treatment for these patients. But which patients do we say no to? 
and would uh, the patients actually accept our decision? Uh, that, that's the balance. Uh, I mean, uh, the experience seems to be that the, the fact that more than 95% of patients are not needing critical care post-op mm. says that the practice seems to be similar everywhere in that we are selecting the patients well. Um, <laughs> That's true. I think uh, recently I had a patient who is morbidly obese. He's uh, had three MIs in the past, obstructive sleep apnea, and rest of this stuff, which is associated with adrenal, was for a block for uh, vascular access, second stage. And uh, on the day morning, or after the, I mean, he was brought in the day before dialysis. On the morning, he kicked off and said, I'm not having unless I get a GA. <laughs> and this patient has been refused, refused renal transplant because of medical problems. And now he had a GA, a successful GA, survived that. And now the surgeons are worried that he might going to ask, is it kind of <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I survived that. So you are going to see that kind of, you're going to see that uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's really coming up. Now people are, you know, wanting to get transplants done. Even the sick ones, the old ones. Yeah. I mean, we do get. I mean, we do get uh, some elderly patients. Um, I was going to come to Ajay as well. Uh, Ajay, uh, thank you for joining as a surgeon. And I think Viji, I think their inputs have been absolutely yeah. essential for this yeah. symposium, and they've been really wonderful. Uh, Ajay. Yeah, just uh, wanted to compliment you all, uh, Chitra, and everyone else, uh, Dr. Ashish Malik, uh, everybody for uh, their immense contribution. Um, uh, some some things I would just say is, is that the patient it has already been the, mentioned there which patient should we not be transplanting and it, as it has already been highlighted somebody who may not survive more than two years oh, yes. for whatever comorbidities is not a patient for transplant kidney transplant again I'm not trying to be over smart here but we need to be aware that when the decision is to be made especially when so called you know that VIP syndrome we all cannot avoid easily but you, we are well aware. I'm not trying to uh, doubt any, uh, raise any doubts about the decision making. But uh, there have been two cabinet ministers in union government few years ago, one after the other, who had transplanted and who died. I'm not sure. Uh, that is very sad. I'm not sure whether I would have done differently. I don't know. Uh, I'm not trying to cast any doubts. It is not a good thing to criticize. But all I'm trying to say is that just because a referral is made for transplant, doesn't mean that we really have to say, oh, yeah, let's go ahead and do a transplant. It is a panacea for all the problems. The second thing has already been pointed out is quite a few decision making, uh, more so in transplant than in any other specialty, are based on, oh, we do like this, means impression-based medicine. So we just need to move towards evidence-based medicine, but not always whatever is published is worth adopting into your practice. So that's a very unique, that not unique, that's a very critical, very important clinical skill to be able to appraise published literature as to what published uh, article is going to change my practice. So that is one more point I thought I would highlight here, uh, that of course, as we move from impression-based medicine to evidence-based medicine. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Ajay. <clears throat> There's one, one question uh, from Anshuman Mishra. He says, uh, have you ever posed a situation where you have to, I mean, okay, it's double face, to face acute rejection of transplanted kidney? And how was that managed? So basically, you get acute rejection, immediate post-op, and uh, how do you, do you go about acute rejection? So maybe I can answer from yeah. my experience. Oh, thank you, thank you. It was just one episode of acute rejection on table. Mm. And uh, I think it was one of the havoc which was created. And uh, initially, the surgeon will always look up to you and your eyes that you've done something you've wrong. Done something wrong. There's, yeah. a, there's a kidney is not working, maybe. And uh, they did the anastomosis again and again. And they put the same kidney in. And slowly you see. And then the nephrologist walks in with his team and... He has different set of ideas, but what I faced was you had to manage the acidosis, you had to manage the hyperkalemia happening, you had the inotropes were doubling, and uh, I think they uh, thought that it was it was all over, and I still persisted. The patient went into the went 
and uh, the next day the kidney suddenly started working so it was a good take home point from here but uh, yeah and there was a lot of blood loss because uh, they had to do the anastomosis two or three times yeah so it was a kidney transplant but slowly turning into a liver transplant okay. <laughs> ajay ajay you got your hands up ajay yeah it is a quite an unenviable situation to be in when the kidney turns blue and uh, it makes everybody anxious so of course we need to have minimal number of people in theater of course just good enough who can really support you and advise you but what i'm really looking for is rather than putting uh, finger pointing to uh, anesthetists to nephrologists or to well always uh, to self uh, is just to make sure that kidney is well perfused patient has got uh, you know adequate cardiac output and if on intraop scan ultrasound scan which we all of us should be able to do if there's good flow into the artery and into the kidney even if the kidney is uh, looking uh, bluish not uh, completely dark and congested uh, as it would happen in hyperacute rejection then it should really pick up its function and yeah. that is much more common in uh, cadaveric kidneys coming from older donors who have had quite a lot of perioperative peri mortem events so it is more likely to happen in that uh, regarding hyperacute rejection the immunologists say that in this era hyperacute rejection should not happen and uh, as they are so clever in finding out those patients who uh, you know who should who would develop hyperacute rejection so that you know immunology is so high tech now i am mm-hmm. not going to those details one day we can discuss a little bit of applied immunology or immunosuppression for the benefit of our colleagues who look after these patients yeah. all i'm trying to say here is that uh, hyperacute rejection should not happen but i must mention about one patient uh, you know much before we started doing uh, you know the living donor abo incompatible transplantation in liverpool which was the first department in northwest to do that before that there was a patient in whom we did cadaveric transplant and the blood group was not correctly written Mm-hmm. and because of that transcription error this kidney turned into blue mm-hmm. and of course there was no way uh, no other way except for taking that kidney out so that was very disappointing for everybody and that was a transcription error it can happen with anybody any one of us i can do it any one of us can do it we just have to really make sure double checks in the uh, in every uh, department which does transplant or any other surgery uh, to have the uh systems of checking double checking and rechecking so that these errors do not happen and we often say oh it happens to that person or the to someone else it can happen to any one of us so we just have to really support and uh, uh, help our colleagues to develop very good protocols that such kind of no uh, you know such such kind of situations do not happen so uh, regarding acute rejection acute rejection happens after 7 days the accelerated rejection happens after about 3 4 days of transplant so if the kidney is blue uh, it is due to some technical reasons which could be either intima uh, you know there can be a number of reasons when we do the vascular anastomosis ranging from kink intimal flap the shower of emboli uh, it could be any one of those or before that we look at uh, patients uh, you know ask the nsa if the patient's blood pressure cardiac output is fine on one instance it happened because of a retractor retractor mm-hmm. pressing onto the common iliac artery so that's what we have to do as soon as i put a retractor i have to make sure that after i put the retractor oh have i compressed onto the artery so these kind of reflexes we need to have in ourselves and help our younger colleagues to develop thank you thank you ajay i think that was very very useful very informative dr okay. ajay yes <laughs> just one thing i would like to add to your comment uh, two central ministers i'll add one more to it <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah yeah are we okay. on youtube live or is this zoom uh, this is this is still on live and, uh, <laughs> okay i hope yeah, this go outside <laughs> so i can actually end the uh, stream now so and the streaming and we have more than 200 uh, with 217 views Okay, yeah. that's good. Yeah. That is really nice.